you won't find anything about it on the news or internet. The case was declared closed soon after the crash, claiming that there were no survivors. I never told anyone about it, not even my late wife. I guess the whole thing traumatized me so much that I just wanted to push it to the back of my mind and never think about it again. But it was always there, gnawing at me, reminding me. So now I'm going to tell you all about it. It was early fall and I had just boarded the plane which would take me home from my two week long business trip. The plane took off just to fine and since I'm so prone to jet lag, I decided to get some sleep. I'm not sure how much time had gone by but I remember a strong turbulence waking me up. I opened my eyes to see luggage falling down and around and passengers screaming in terror. What's going on? I instantly became alert, asking the terrified lady next to me. She outright ignored me, clutching her seat feverishly. Oxygen masks had dropped from above and I put mine on as soon as it did, buckling my seatbelt with trembling hands. I looked outside the window and saw the tops of endless rows of trees dangerously close and getting closer by the second. This is it. It's all over. Those were my last thoughts before impact and everything went dark. I awoke on the floor of the airplane. Luggage, spilled food and other items were all around me. I looked up towards the pilot's cabin and was met with a view of trees. The plane had apparently broken into pieces but the fuse lodge seemed as somewhat intact, despite the mess around me. My first thought was, I survived. I'm looking down on my aching body and trying to assess the damage. I was pretty bruised up and my shoulder had a minor cut, but other than that, nothing serious. It was then that I heard the voices of other passengers around me. To my left, it sounded like a woman was crying, and another woman was consoling her. In front of me, I heard a moaning sound, while to my right was a man who seemed to be bruised up like me, but fine. I got up and realized that a handful of us were still alive, and some were already checking the dead bodies for their vital signs. We need to help the injured now, one of these survivors shouted. I joined in to help them with that, checking the pulses of the passengers that weren't messed up so badly that they could potentially be alive. Linda, she's gone. I'm sorry. The consoling woman told the young girl who was sobbing over what we later figured out was her sister's disfigured body. A few minutes later, we saw a passenger who was alive in a seat, but just barely. He had a metal pipe hanging from his gut and his legs were crushed beyond recognition. He begged us to kill him and after some hesitation, Mitch, one of these survivors, took a hatchet to him. The rest of us turned away. We could hardly bear listening to the sound of the hatchet connecting to the man's skull, let alone watch it. What should we do? Linda asked. Basic rules say that we should stay put, and rescue will have an easier time finding us, I said. Yeah, he's right, another one of these survivors said. We need to set up an SOS signal and try to contact someone. Amber, are you getting anything? He asked the woman who was consoling Linda earlier. She was on her phone trying to see if she could get a signal. Nothing. She shook her head in desperation. Not a single bar. Well, then we have no choice but to wait. Another survivor responded. We have to set up shelter. It's going to get cold tonight, I said. Wait, we're not going to be here for that long, are we? Mitch asked. Not tonight and maybe a few more nights, I said. We have to ration our food and get cozy. 
Well, what about the ones who died? We have to give them a burial. Linda said through tears. We will, sweetie, Amber told her. But right now, we have to think about our own survival. We went outside to see where we were. But despite having a small clearing, all around us were tall trees blocking our view. A few broken trees lay around, as a result of the plane knocking them down upon impact. Since there were no major elevations nearby, there was no way of telling how close or far we were from civilization. When we carried out the dead bodies and lined them up in front of the plane, we decided not to use our strength for digging, since who knows how long we would have to stay here. So instead, we just covered them with sheets and clothing. In total, there were only six of us left alive. Linda, Amber, Mitch, Will, Norton, and myself. At around dusk, it started to get really cold. So we used the luggage to block the opening in the door as much as we could. Mitch used rocks to form an SOS sign in the small clearing behind the plane in hopes to get the rescuers' attention faster. When night fell, we still couldn't get rid of the impending cold, so we put on extra clothes and huddled up on makeshift beds made from clothing and blankets of other passengers. And we ate a meager meal of a candy bar per person and decided to get some sleep. Most of the group members fell asleep quickly, with the exception of Linda crying herself to sleep. I was the last one to fall asleep. I'm not sure what time it was when I suddenly woke up at the sound of a twig snapping outside of the plane. I thought that maybe somebody had found us so I shot up and peered out of the window. I couldn't see anything, so I approached the luggage barricade and peered through the hole. I was met with pitch of darkness outside our plane. I had never been camping before, so to see the woods in such absolute blackness it terrified me. Thinking the sound may have been from an animal, I was about to return to bed when I heard another snap of a twig close by. I grabbed a flashlight and moved some of the luggage away, enough to make an opening for myself. I went outside and scanned the area with a beam of light. Hello? I called out, hoping against hope that something human would hear me. No one was there. I went around the plane with every twig that I stepped on echoing throughout the woods. It was then that I realized how quiet it actually was. When I went to bed, the forest had been brimming with the sounds of its inhabitants. Now there wasn't a single sound. No birds, insects, nothing. I remembered that when a forest goes quiet, it usually means that there's a predator nearby. My heart started racing and I carefully scanned the area with my flashlight again and proceeded to back away towards the plane. I got to the barricade of luggage and as I was about to climb, I heard another sound from behind me. It sounded like something was slowly being dragged across the ground. I pointed my flashlight towards the source of the sound, to the pile of dead bodies. Slowly, I moved the beam from right to left across the still corpses covered by clothes. My flashlight finally reached the edge of the body line on the left, and my heart started thumping even faster. One of the jackets had been moved aside and the space where a body had once been, between two other bodies, was now gone. The dragging sound resounded again. I moved the flashlight up and saw the body of a woman lying on the floor, and then it limply slid further into darkness by a few inches, with that same dragging sound, leaving only her legs hanging in the light. I pointed the flashlight further upwards, and saw the woman's wide eyes staring blankly towards the sky, with an expressionless face. But that's not what scared me. And clasping the woman's hair just at the edge of the light was a skinny yet muscular black hairy hand. Two glowing eyes reflected back from the flashlight 
and as soon as the creature saw me, it produced a very short scream. We're talking like milliseconds here. It ran off with the sound of loud and impossibly quick footsteps, echoing and at the same time fading almost instantly, dragging the woman behind itself into the darkness. I dropped the flashlight and ran back to the plane. I blocked the opening with the luggage, panting. I returned to my seat, surprised that nobody was awake by my loud footsteps and breathing. I covered myself, keeping an eye on the luggage barricade. All night I thought that I imagined skinny hands poking their way in, but whenever I blinked, they were gone. Sometime before dawn I finally fell asleep. I awoke to the chirping of the birds and the voices outside of the plane. I sighed in relief, the nightmare still freshly imprinted in my mind. I went outside and saw Norton and Will standing near the pile of bodies and having a heated discussion. I approached them to ask what they were talking about and Norton said, One of the dead passengers is missing. It might have been a bear. I looked past them towards the corpses and saw the space where one of the dead bodies should have been. And beyond that, distinctive tracks of something heavy being dragged in the ground stretched and disappeared in the tree line ahead. I knew what I saw the first night outside the plane wreck made no logical sense, so I went along with Will and Norton's theory that it was a bear that had dragged the body away, opting not to tell them that I saw something suspicious. I assumed that I was in shock from the plane crash and saw something that shouldn't have been there. On day two, when everybody woke up, we gathered up in front of the plane and started making plans. We had enough food to last us for three days at most if we rationed it, but we assumed that we might be stuck much longer than that. It was a long flight and the area that we were stuck in was huge, so rescue was expected to be slow. Amber tried getting a signal on her phone again before her battery had died but no dice. I told her to keep her phone off until we would find a more elevated area. On that note, Mitch decided to gather wood, while Norton prepared traps for rabbits or any other animals that we could find. Will's job was to move the bodies further away from the plane in order to prevent the bear from coming near us again. My job was to try to find a hill to climb or anything that could potentially lead us to our freedom. Mitch told me not to go too far away under any circumstances, and he gave me a lipstick to mark the trees, not to get lost. I put on a backpack and took a power bar and a bottled water with me, and I started heading in one direction. I wanted to bring a knife, but the only thing we had was the hatchet which we assumed came with the plane for breaking down doors and emergencies, and the others needed it for chopping wood. And besides, if a bear attacks you, we'll lose you and we'll lose the hatchet, Mitch said. Now remember, Norton said as he escorted me out of our shelter, if you run into a bear, just play dead. He may toss you around, but as long as you don't move, you should be fine. Now, if it's a grizzly, I know, shout at him until he gets offended and runs away, I said, and assume a high power posture, you want him to feel threatened. How do I know if it's a bear or a grizzly, I asked. Grizzlies have a hump on their shoulder, I think. You think? I raised my eyebrows. Look, as long as you go on shouting, the bear will know to avoid you. How do you know that? I watched it on that survival show with Bear Grylls. Oh, and don't run. Bears will see you as prey if you run and then you're screwed. I went my own way while the others attended to their business. As I went on, I would occasionally shout phrases like, Hey, or hello, to scare off any potential bears. I used lipstick to mark the trees that I passed by with an axe every 10 and 20 steps or so. 
The terrain was uneven and I almost twisted my ankle a few times so by the time an hour had passed, I realized that I probably hadn't gotten too far from the camp. All the while I ran into slopes here and there, but no major hills or anything, so I reckoned that we would have to climb one of the trees to get a good view of the area. I turned back and started to retrace my steps, since I figured that I would need some time to get back. I followed the trees which I marked for about half an hour, until I reached a tree which made me stop dead in my tracks. The X which I had marked on the tree was visibly smudged. Now it could have been a squirrel or something. I know, but this was different. The smudge went down from the X in three even lines, as if somebody had drawn their fingers across the tree bark. I held my breath as I checked out my surroundings and I suddenly became aware of the stupid, stupid mistake that I had made once more. I didn't pay attention to the sounds and the forest had gone silent during my walk when I wasn't listening. I suddenly felt like I was being watched. I didn't know if I should shout to chase the potential bear away or be quiet to avoid drawing attention because something told me what I was dealing with here was not a regular forest predator. I opted for the second option and silently proceeded back towards the camp, painfully aware of every leaf crunching under my feet. I kept looking over my shoulder every now and again, always afraid that I would be met face to face with something incomprehensible. The further I went though, the quieter that it got around me. I felt like I was walking straight into the predator's arms, and then I heard something which made me stop. As I stepped on a crunching leaf, I heard a crunch a hundred feet behind me. I wasn't sure if it was an echo or my imagination, but I shot around nonetheless and quickly scanned the area. Nothing was there. So then why did the hair on the back of my neck stand straight? and I felt such primordial fear. I slowly scanned the trees again and stopped on one of them. Something was off about this one tree. And then my scream caught up my throat when I realized what I was staring at was a black figure peeking from behind the tree. It wasn't moving and it was staring directly at me, with one hand held around the side of the tree. It stared at me as if I wasn't aware of it and it was stalking me. I stared at it in silence for a while and it stared back, neither of us moving. I almost convinced myself that it was my imagination, like the way you see your pile of clothes on your chair in the middle of the night. But then its hand moved slightly down across the tree. I couldn't tell due to the distance, but one thing was for sure. That was no bear. I turned around and started running, not caring about the rules that Norton told me. Forget the rules. Forget finding any elevation. I just ran as quickly as I could to find safety. After what felt like ages, I started hearing the voices of my fellow survivors in the distance and these sounds of the forest came back to life. I soon saw the playing group gathered around a campfire. I ran to them and turned around to see if I was being followed, but nothing was there. You okay, Sam? Amber asked. There's something out there, I said panting, not taking my eyes off the direction that I had just come from. Everyone was confused and when I explained to them what I saw just now and the night before, some of them became visibly worried. We agreed not to leave camp and Mitch suggested to make a barricade around in order to prevent dangerous animals from wandering in. Each survivor was to carry something for defense. However, since everybody was short of weapons save for Mitch, who claimed the hatchet for himself, the others got makeshift spears from wood. No one believed my description of the creature that I saw. Heck, even I wasn't sure what I saw but they all agreed that it wasn't safe to go alone. 
After lunch, we gathered up some more wood for the fire and tried to pass the time by talking to each other. Amber was a businesswoman who was on a trip like me. She used to be married, but work came first for her. Alinda was having the hardest time of us all, having witnessed her sister's death in the crash. The two of them were on vacation when it all happened. She racked her mind about how her parents would react, but Amber comforted her most of the time. Mitch was an athlete who had a knee injury, so he was visiting his physiotherapist in the country. He considered himself lucky to even come out alive, let alone avoid more severe injuries in the crash. Will was a programmer and that's all we managed to get out of him, while Norton was an assistant professor. Like Linda, he was also on vacation. It got dark and cold pretty soon despite only being around 5pm, so we decided that it was time to get back inside the airplane. Will insisted on staying outside and keeping the fire going, since it greatly improved our odds of being found. Although I didn't feel happy about him staying out there alone, I knew that he was right and I sure as heck didn't want to be the one to stay out there. At around 8 p.m., Mitch Norton and I joined him outside to keep him company. He had started building a makeshift fence by then, and big sturdy branches were already sticking out of the ground in various places around the camp. And when I'm done here, this camp will be enough to last us through the entire winter, Will proudly said. Well, let's hope we don't have to stay here for so long, I replied. Norton went to take a leak. You think they'll find us soon? Will asked. It shouldn't be more than ten days, Mitch replied. This didn't seem to lift Will's spirits. Norton was done taking a leak so he zipped up his pants. Well, one thing's for sure, he said as he turned around towards us. At least we're spending some time away from technology. Will poked the burning wood while Mitch stared at the fire. The fire cracked violently for a moment, illuminating Norton's face in the area around him. In that split second, I saw something black and hairy behind him, slowly creeping up on all fours, before it merged with the darkness again. It was the same creature from before. It was on all fours, right behind Norton. I opened my mouth and tried to scream, but no sound came out. It all happened so fast. Norton's jovial expression turned into one of surprise as he got yanked backwards, and his sudden screaming mixed with the sound of dragging faded only moments later, as if he somehow managed to run a hundred yards in mere seconds. Everybody else instantly became alert. Uh, Norton? Mitch stood up. Norton! Norton's now barely audible screams faded completely and the only sound remaining was the crackling of fire. Norton! Mitch shouted again, only getting his echo as a response. Sam, what happened? It... it just took him. I barely uttered. What took him? Mitch asked. And then a scream came through, which froze my bone to the marrow. It sounded like screeching tires which echoed throughout the woods and all the way to our camp. We gotta get back inside, now, I shouted. Wait, we gotta go help Norton, Mitch said. Mitch, think about it. If we go out there now, we're as good as dead. We gotta get back to the plane right now. All three of us ran back to the plane and barricaded it back with the luggage. The two girls were confused and distressed, asking where Norton was and what that inhuman scream was. But we had no time to explain. Listen, we need to be as quiet as possible. We don't know what's going on, but some dangerous animal is out there, Mitch said. And we sat for what felt like hours, long after the flame had died down. Everybody was slumped down in the plane seats, clutching their spears. I started to get sleepy, when a noise came from outside the plane. The snap of a twig. Shh. Mitch said, lying across these seats with the hatchet held tightly to his chest. 
A sound of scratching came from my side of the plane and I froze in place. A moment later, it stopped. I heard something that sounded like sniffing followed by the sound of footsteps upon leaves which faded away. I gathered the courage to lift my head just enough to peek through the window. At first I saw nothing, and then through the darkness I saw movement. A tall, hunched over figure was standing where the bodies had been moved. It bent down to inspect them before grabbing one with its abnormally long arm and dragging it away into the darkness, just like it did with the woman the night before. And we got no sleep until sunrise. On the early morning of day three, the chirping of the birds returned. That's how we knew it was safe to go back outside. Despite that, we were still extremely paranoid when going out, and so we carefully observed the surrounding first. Okay, I think it's gone. Mitch shouted to the rest of us. We followed him outside. Mitch turned to me with heavy bags under his eyes and asked, Sam, what the heck is that thing? I saw it a few times by now, but I never managed to get a good look at it. I shook my head. Well, did you see it? Mitch turned to Will. I didn't even see what happened to Norton until I heard the screaming, Will said. We stood in silence for a while. We can't stay here anymore, Linda said. Well, we can't go wandering around the woods with that thing stalking us there. We'll be sitting ducks, Mitch responded. So what then? Amber interjected. I looked around and thought for a moment. I knew what the right thing to do was, but I hated the idea every bit anyway. We have to rescue Norton, I finally said. We can't leave him behind. Whoa now, Mitch raised his hand. I didn't see it very well, but that creature looked pretty dangerous to me. We can't try to go against it. Yeah, not to mention how fast it is. Norton's screams were here one moment and then, Will said. I think we're going to be safe if we bring torches, I said. The creature, whatever it is, stalked me from afar yesterday morning, and it was in our camp the night before, but it never approached while there was a fire going. And when I pointed my flashlight at it, it scurried away with the body of the passenger. It's a long shot, I know, but it's worth a try. Okay, but how the heck do we find Norton? He could be anywhere. For all we know, he could be dead. I pointed to the pile of dead bodies and said, Last night it dragged another body away. It's always dragging them in the same direction. I think that it might have a place where it stays. If we follow the tracks, we might be able to find it. Again, did you see how fast it is? Wool said. It could take us days to find it, if we even find it. Well, while it's alive, none of us are safe here, I said. We've got enough water, but food will run out soon. We have to start thinking of alternatives. Yeah, the creature probably needs water, right? Amber asked. There might be a creek nearby, and if there is, following it will get us out of the woods. We spent some time discussing it, and in the end, we came to the conclusion that we would make some torches, stock up on food, and follow its trail. We packed everything useful and made torches by cutting a few branches and wrapping them in cloth. We had no oil or fuel to make the flames last longer, so we figured we would just need the torches to last us long enough to ward off the beast, should we come face to face with it. The thought of anger in that thing filled me with unspeakable fear, but also defiant satisfaction. One way or another, this would all be over soon. We inspected the place where Norton had been kidnapped, and it quickly became apparent that the tracks where he had been dragged in the ground were either clear of leaves or there was an obvious sign of leaves being flattened in places. If we wait too long and more leaves fall, We'll lose the trail. We have to go now, Will said as he picked up a leaf, inspecting it curiously. 
The rest of us agreed and we let Will take the lead. Since he seemed to have the best eye in figuring where to go whenever we lost the trail. Only a few hundred yards away we saw two tracks merging into one. And it didn't take us long to figure out that one was Norton. And the other was from the body the creature had dragged off last night. It made it all the more easy for us since the trail became a lot clearer. It also fortified Amber's theory that it had a layer, since the creature seemed to always move on the same path. We walked for about 30 minutes before we saw a blue piece of fabric on a nearby log. Will quickly bent down to inspect it. I think this is Norton's, he said. He was wearing blue pants. Uh, this isn't good. Why not? Linda asked. I think there's blood on it. He raised the fabric for everybody to see. Linda gasped and Mitch inhaled through his teeth. Now don't worry, it doesn't look like he was injured badly, but we better hurry, Will said. We went on for an hour before running into something completely unexpected off trail. A big piece of metal. We looked past it and saw more tiny pieces scattered around. Look! Mitch pointed at a tiny clearing and then the rest of us saw it too. What was left of the pilot's cockpit was woefully sitting in the clearing, partially facing down with its nose. There might be something that we could use there, I said. We approached the cockpit and immediately saw the body of one of the pilots. He was sitting in the chair in front of the cracked windshield, head slumped backwards. His abdomen was covered in blood but we weren't sure whether the crash or something else had killed him. Mitch saw an open first aid kit and although some of the contents were used up, we took it just to be on the safe side. I glanced to the floor and saw a small device that looked like an mp3 player of sorts, next to a flare gun. I knelt down and reached out to it, when a freezing hand grabbed my wrist. I looked up at the pilot who previously had his eyes shut and now stared at me wide-eyed. You have to run. He spoke with a trembling voice. Get out of here before it returns. I pulled back in horror, pulling the pilot off the chair along with me. He stumbled down like a rag doll and ceased moving altogether. Oh my god. Linda clasped her mouth with her hands. Mitch approached the pilot and checked his pulse. He's dead, he said confused. I picked up the flare gun and device which were on the ground. The gun had a round in it so I put it in my pocket and pressed the play button on the device. A voice started speaking through it. This is Captain Miles. Our plane crashed less than an hour ago. My co-pilot and I are miraculously alive. We don't know where the passengers are, since the plane broke into pieces. We still don't know what went wrong. We contacted control, but there was no response. We'll stay here and wait for rescue. We don't have much food or water left, so we'll make do with what we have. There was a pause before the voice started speaking again. This is Captain Miles. Ten hours have passed since the crash. We saw somebody moving in the distance a while ago, but whoever it was, they ran away. If we're lucky, it's one of the locals and we aren't far from civilization. Another pause and then... This is Captain Miles. It's been roughly a day since the crash. We keep seeing someone in the distance always hiding behind trees. Whenever we shout for the person and ask for help, they run away. My coworker says that it's a bear since he got a closer look. Just in case we're keeping our flare gun close by and we'll continue having a campfire to stave off any potential predators. A short pause and then the captain's panting was heard. He said in a panic. Holy crap, this is Captain Miles, that is no bear. I didn't manage to get a good look at it but when I heard my co-pilot screaming, I turned around and saw him getting dragged away by this, this hairy thing. I tried to follow them, but it was too fast and it's dark, and I had to go back to the cockpit. 
I'm staying here until morning and then I'm getting the heck out of here. Another pause, at this time longer. I thought the recording was over, but then Miles continued. This is Captain Miles. I tried running away, but this thing keeps toying with me. Wherever I go, it's there, just peeking behind the trees, pretending to hide. But I think it wanted me to see it. It knew what it was doing, because by noon, I had taken so many reroutes that I was back at the plane and the creature was gone. I'll have to stay here and defend myself if it attacks. Another pause before Miles' shallow panting can be heard again. He said, It got me. It freaking got me. But I managed to wound it before it could finish me off. Shot two flares and managed to take a few of its fingers with the first one. The second flare only scared it away. It seems to be afraid of unnatural lights and fire. This thing is really smart. It scouts during the day and attacks during the night. There is a growl from the recorder. Linda cradled her arms looking over her shoulder as if she expected the creature to appear right then behind her. The pilot continued. It's close now watching me. I can see it just beyond the fire. It won't come close as long as the fire is going, but I'm almost out of wood. I hope it can last until morning, but if it doesn't, I have one more flare remaining. I may not kill it, but I sure as heck will do a number on it before it takes me. If anyone finds this, don't wait for rescue. Kill the creature. Don't try running away because it will always follow. It knows this forest better than anything living in it. As for me, I'm not going to survive my wounds either way. Captain Miles out. The recording stopped. We listened in silence and horror. Jesus Christ, Mitch said in a trembling voice. Well, that does it, I said. We have to kill it. Did you even hear what the pilot said? Mitch snapped. He fired a flare at it and it's still alive. Yeah, but we can't leave until it's dead. Don't you get it? It will never let us leave the forest alive, so it's either us or it. I'm not going to fight with that thing at first. All we have is this hatchet and there's no way. Wait. Wool raised his hand and interrupted Mitch. Where's Amber? We shot around and gave Linda, who was standing at the back, an accusatory look. She was here just a moment ago, she said. Amber, where are you? Will shouted. And then we all saw it and it made our hearts sink to the floor. Blood. A trail of blood went along the clearing and into the tree line. Oh God, we have to go find her, Linda said. Mitch took point and started following the trail, calling Amber's name along the way. It was evident that she had lost a lot of blood and was in the best case scenario badly wounded. The trail of blood started to thin out pretty soon, but since it merged with the tracks we followed prior to that, it wasn't very difficult to stay in the right path. How could you even let this happen, Linda? Mitch shouted in frustration. Why are you blaming me for this? Linda defended herself. You were right next to her, Mitch rebutted. Mitch, back off, it wasn't her fault, I said. We continued striding in silence. Hey guys, wait up. Will shouted from the back, barely able to keep up with Mitch, who was practically jogging now. No, come on, we have to hurry. Mitch shouted back before stopping dead in his tracks, making me bump into him. What the heck, Mitch? I shouted. And then I realized why he had stopped. In front of us was a cliff, and carved into it was a narrow passage into a cave. The passage itself was obscured by branches so it could be easily missed, even walking right next to it. The tracks of blood led inside and disappeared in the darkness of the cave. This must be the lair. Mitch muttered and turned to the rest of us. You guys ready? No one responded. Mitch whipped out his lighter and lit his own torch and then ours and went in without a moment of hesitation. I remember watching him and his flame get consumed by the darkness and admiring him, wondering if he was courageous or just foolish. 
The rest of us followed into what I expected would be a small cave, turned out to be a complex combination of tunnel after tunnel. The passages were barely wide enough for even one of us to go through, so we went in a row, Mitch in front, then Will, then me, and then Linda. Oh Jesus. Mitch stopped again and looked at a particular spot on the ground. What is it? I asked. He simply continued walking and said, Come on, let's move. As I walked past what he was looking at on the ground, my torch illuminated enough for me to realize that I was looking at a human hand. A feminine, blood-curdling scream suddenly came from the cave, somewhere in the distance. Amber! Mitch shouted again and started running. I followed him and Will closely behind, clutching the torch in one hand and the flare gun in the other. The screams continued as if somebody was being flayed alive, but it was impossible to tell which direction they were coming from. Mitch and Will rounded the corner and their flames disappeared out of sight, so I hurried after them, yelling at them to slow down. The ground was uneven and slippery and I could barely see in front of myself. Another scream echoed. I turned around and realized that Linda was gone. Linda, are you there? I asked, but no response came through. There was a low growl coming from the darkness in front of me reverberating on the walls all around me. I started running back in the direction of Mitch and Will, completely forgetting about the flare gun in my panic state. I couldn't see where my companion's torch flames were, and when I reached a forking in the passages, I panicked even more. With the inhuman scream following closely behind me, I rushed to the left, now full-on sprinting unsteadily. I kept losing balance due to the uneven ground but I kept running for dear life, not caring where I was going. I just wanted to be as far away from that creature as possible. And then I felt the ground disappear from beneath my feet and I stumbled forward, falling down somewhere and hitting my head. Everything went dark after that. I woke up with a throbbing head. It was pitch black in front of me as I felt my way around the ground with my hands. I felt pebbles and rocks shifting and sliding. I no longer had my torch, however, the flare gun was still in my pocket. The screams that followed me previously were gone now, leaving me only with the sound of my own heavy panting. I didn't dare call out to my fellow survivors under fear of attracting something far worse. I still had my backpack on so I reached into it and felt around until I found the lighter. I steadied myself on the pebbles that kept sliding from underneath me, and flicked it once. Immediately, the flames sparked to life. I gasped in terror at the sight before me. Those weren't pebbles, but instead, human bones. Hundreds, no thousands of them on one big pile, covered in dry blood and dirt. I screamed and fell backwards. The light on my lighter disappearing instantly. I scooted back until my back hit the wall, hyperventilating. I flicked the lighter once more as soon as I was calmer and observed my surroundings. Bones were everywhere and I saw no way out, but there had to be one. I stood up and unsteadily walked across the giant tomb balancing myself on both legs in one hand, while holding the lighter with the other. The cave seemed to lead forward, so I followed the only remaining passage, hoping that it wouldn't end with a dead end. There was a crack in the wall ahead, big enough for me to go through, and I heard the sound of water somewhere in the distance. With rekindled hope, I followed the sound, cursing at myself for allowing me to get into this situation. I wondered where Linda, Will, and Mitch were, but I was also too preoccupied with claustrophobia and fear of being eaten alive to worry too much about them. And then I felt myself step into a puddle of water. 
I illuminated the ground and realized that I was standing in a creek, which led to a tiny area contrasting the pitch of darkness all around me. I hurried up, splashing my way through and breathing so loudly that my voice echoed throughout the cave. But then I remembered that I should probably be more quiet. The sound of water was getting louder and when I finally reached the semi-illuminated part of the cave, I was in a more open area with a crack on the ceiling, letting in a faint beam of moonlight. I thank God for getting me out of the narrow tunnels, but my relief was short-lived when I heard a crunch echo from my left. I turned my head to the source of the sound slowly and saw movement in the distance. As my eyes adjusted, I saw a black figure hunched over, facing away from me. My heart started to race because I realized there was no way that that sort of shape could be one belonging to a human being. It was eating something and I dreaded to think what its meal was. I immediately flicked my lighter off and as I stood there, frozen in place, I looked around and realized that the only way out was in the direction of the creature. At first I thought that there's no way I would try to get past it, but then I remembered the only other way was to go back to the lair filled with bones. I mustered my courage put the flare gun into my hand and slowly began towards the opening where the creature was. With each crunch it made, my heart jumped just a little bit. As I got closer, the creature came into view a lot more clearly. Although it was hunched over and squatting, it was still pretty huge, almost as tall as I was. It had mangy black fur all over its body, the shape of which was somewhat humanoid. Another loud crunch followed by a chewing sound. The creature tossed a bone sideways in a bemused way, which fell down with a loud clank and started chewing on something else. I was only a few feet away from it now and I slowly took steps sideways, not daring to look away. And then I saw what, or rather who, it was eating. Linda's eyes stared back at me blankly as the creature gnawed on what was left of her leg. I covered my mouth with my hands to stop myself from screaming and continued sidestepping. The creature suddenly stopped chewing and shot its head up, sniffing the air. I stopped moving and held my breath my heart just about ready to burst out of my chest. The creature continued sniffing more vigorously, now swiveling its head left and right. I could just barely make out a nose which resembled a snout, covered in the same fur as the rest of its body. The creature stood frozen for a long moment, listening. I pointed the flare gun at it with trembling hands, ready to pull the trigger. The creature looked back down and continued eating. I lowered my gun and continued stepping away. I was able to put myself at a safe distance to speed up a little bit and sighed in relief when I turned the corner. I leaned on my knees and steadied my breathing, with my heart still pounding in my chest. And then I felt something grab my shoulder and I just about jumped out of my skin. It was Mitch. He was holding his finger up to his mouth in a way to tell me to be quiet. I leaned in and whispered, Where the heck did you guys run off to? And where's Will? I lost him, Mitch said. We were attacked right after we found Amber and... You found her. Mitch shushed me and said, Keep your voice down. Yeah, we found her. What was left of her anyway? She was missing her foot and her arm all the way to the shoulder socket. Poor girl was begging us to end her. You killed her? I asked. I had to, she couldn't move. She was in a lot of pain and there was no way she would survive. Will and I both agreed to do it. Listen, right now we have to find Will and Norton if they're still alive, I suggested. 
No way, we gotta get out of here, Mitch said. That thing is invincible. Will had managed to chase it away with the torch, but it's way too fast and they always come back. I'm not leaving them behind, I said. Mitch stared at me for a while before saying, Fine, let's look for them. Where's the flare gun you picked up? Right here, I raised my hand. Keep it close. We went through the cave, and luckily Mitch had his flashlight, so it was much more convenient than going with the lighter. The cave was practically a maze, and after what felt like hours, we agreed that finding an exit should be our priority. We had just about given up hope when we heard something that sounded like footsteps in the distance. Moreover, it sounded like boots or shoes, which rekindled our hope that it might be Will. I peeked around the corner and saw a person standing in the middle of the cave, pointing his flashlight around. Will, I whispered. He turned around, his eyes wide in fear, until he recognized us and relief had washed over his face. He smiled and we went out to meet him. Oh, thank goodness you're alive, Will said. I've been trying to. Will's sentence was cut off when a big black figure ran right past in front of our noses and took Will along with it. Will screamed as the creature held his neck with its teeth and rapidly jerked him left and right. Mitch ran up to the creature and swung his hatchet hard, embedding it in the creature's back. The creature let go of Will's neck, which was now at an unnatural angle, and screamed out in pain. The entire cave echoed and my ears had started to hurt. Before Mitch could pull the axe out, the creature turned around, grabbing at its back, unable to reach the axe. It then turned its attention to Mitch and with a movement faster than the blink of an eye, swiped its claws across the air. I didn't even realize what happened until I saw Mitch bleeding from his throat and grabbing at his neck. The creature screamed again, revealing a row of sharp teeth. It tackled Mitch and sank its teeth into his neck, biting off a chunk of it and a few of his fingers in the process. All of this happened so fast that I barely had any time to react, plus the whole thing put me in a trance. And then the creature looked up at me with glowing eyes, snarling blood dripping from its chin. I pointed the flare gun at the creature and fired. The entire area was immediately illuminated with a bright red color, and the creature screamed even louder, grabbing at its eye which had now lost its glow, flailing its arms furiously. I glanced at the bodies of my fellow passengers. Both of them were now dead. I turned on my heel and I bolted out of there, the screams of that creature following me all the way through the cave. I ran for what felt like hours, tired but never stopping. The thought of meeting my demise like the rest of them filled me with inexplicable fear. After a while, I finally saw moonlight peeking from a crack in the distance, and I hurried up to it. I felt a cold breeze as I got closer, and I squeezed my way through, breathing in fresh air and listening to the soothing sounds of the forest life around me. The scream of the creature echoed from inside the cave once more, this time sounding like a cry of pure anger and although it was distant, I knew that it could change any moment. I stumbled through the woods, always looking over my shoulder and expecting to see the creature either behind or suddenly appearing in front of me. And daylight came soon and I fell to the ground, exhausted, hungry, and thirsty. The adrenaline subsided and I started to feel guilty and ashamed for allowing the other passengers to die like that. I broke down, rocking back and forth and letting my guilt gnaw me like that for a while. And then I heard something in the distance. Voices. I couldn't tell what they were saying, but when I looked up, 
I saw a group of people walking around. I called out to them and they immediately approached me, realizing that I was in distress. I tried explaining to them that there was a dangerous predator nearby, but they didn't seem to understand what I was saying. They spoke to me, but I didn't understand their language. I figured they were locals and cried out again in happiness when I realized that I was safe. And that's how I was brought back to civilization. I told the rescue services that going back to the crash site is dangerous, but they ignored me. They dismissed my stories as exaggeration due to trauma, and they continued their search. Not even two days later, the case was closed, and a statement made that there were no survivors. Norton's body was never found, but then again they never found the cave that I mentioned either. I've been plagued by survivor's guilt, nightmares, and PTSD ever since. I would wake up thinking that I feel the presence in my room, quietly watching me and waiting for the moment when I let my guard down. I never go camping and I've never used planes again either, except once two days ago. I'm in a small town right now close to the crash site. The locals here are friendly, but when I ask them about the creature, they suddenly go silent or find an excuse to leave. Others swear the creature that I'm describing is peaceful and that running into it poses no threat. The third portion denies the creature's existence altogether, calling me crazy. All locals share one opinion though. No one should go to the area of the sightings. I don't know what that thing is and I don't care. I have a gun over here and tomorrow I'm going back to the crash site. One way or another, I'm taking that creature down. I'm a pilot for a reputed cargo airline in the US. I've had the most bizarre experience of my flying career and I don't know what to do. It was a normal day in Florida. I had checked my laptop for the flight schedule. I had to go from Miami to Puerto Rico and back. That sounded like great news to me. I could come home on the same day at least. My co-pilot for the flight was a guy named Jim. I immediately took to him during our pre-flight briefings and we stepped into our retrofitted Boeing 737. The first leg of the flight was normal with no turbulence, except for the air traffic control and diverting us over Cuba to avoid a bit of stormy looking clouds over the ocean. And we missed the Bermuda Triangle, announced Jim looking at his digital map. Well, you believe in those fairy tales, I asked him. I had flown the route a couple of times before and had never noticed anything different about the so-called Bermuda Triangle. It was probably a hoax by some adults living in their parents' basement seeking attention. Oh, it's real, all right, said Jim seriously. Why do you think we were diverted over Cuba? I chuckled. Diversions happen all the time, Jim. A storm cloud is nothing paranormal. There was no time to discuss this further as we had to prepare for landing. We landed safely, the crew reloaded the plane and the ground crew started to refuel the aircraft. One of the mechanics came up to me with a frown on his face. Um, Captain, there seems to be a slight issue. A slight issue, huh? Yes, Captain, it looks like a fuel leak in one of the lines. I sighed. Company policy on suspected fuel leaks was to perform an inspection and ground the aircraft, and who knows how long that would take. I called the dispatcher back home, and after consulting with the engineering team, they gave the green light to perform the inspection. And Jim and I had a bit of lunch in the airport, and I was reading some stuff on my phone in the crew room to pass the time. Long story short, after about six hours, the mechanics told us that the plane was airworthy once again, and that we could fly back. Heck, at least no passengers were complaining to the management. It was evening and darkness had started to fall. I was a bit happy as the late flight home meant that my flight tomorrow would be rescheduled. 
This time, though, we were flying right over the Bermuda Triangle, and Jim wasn't happy about it. I just have this eerie sensation. Every time I fly over this, it looks so creepy in the dark. It's because of the endless ocean. It does look pitch dark outside. I joked and that's where things started to go sideways. There was a jolt and the aircraft shook. I frowned. Uh, that's some strong wind. Jim looked scared. I don't know, Captain. That didn't feel natural. At once, the 737 started to shake uncontrollably, and my heart leapt into my mouth as the aircraft had started to lose altitude. At night, you can't see a thing out of the windshield and over the ocean. It's impossible to gauge your height. Naturally, I started to scan the instruments for any indication of defects. Maybe the engineers had done something wrong. What is going on? asked Jim. I grabbed the yoke and tried to force the nose up. Uh, power back, Jim. Jim pulled the throttle back and I held the yoke with an iron grip. After a terrifying two minutes, the aircraft leveled out and both of us breathed a sigh of relief. Maybe the storm cloud earlier had caused an air pocket and it was our bad luck to stumble on it. Oh crap, said Jim looking out the window and what I saw made my blood run cold. At night, the white cloud cover that you normally see when flying isn't that visible and depends on the moon, but what I saw defied all explanation. The clouds below us were forming a vortex and were blood red. To my horror, the aircraft started to shudder and the clouds started spinning. I think Jim wet himself as we were being sucked in. The nose tipped towards the swirling vortex that looked like it was a portal to hell. I frantically tried to control the plane, but it was like something else had taken over. The controls were unresponsive, and we were going down fast. Jim and I exchanged a horrified look. We knew that this was it, and we were going to crash. Was this how so many countless deaths were caused? An anomaly in the weather that not even our brainiest scientists could figure out. But then something even more bizarre happened. The vortex had seemed to spit us out, and we were flying in a completely different place. It was like we had been transported to another dimension. The sky was darker and the clouds were black and red, and the air was filled with an ominous silence. I couldn't understand what was going on. Scientifically, I rejected the theory of alternate dimensions, but a horrible feeling grew in my chest. Was it real after all? What gave me the creeps even more was the land below us. It looked like the surface of Mars. What the heck just happened? Jim asked, visibly shaken. I don't know, but I think we need to get out of here fast, I replied. I tried to turn the plane around, but the controls were still unresponsive. We were trapped in this otherworldly place with no way out. To make it worse, our navigation system wasn't showing us anything and it was blank. I tried to place a call using our plane's satellite calling system, but it wouldn't connect. Yeah, we were screwed. And that's when things started to get even stranger. I saw something moving outside of the window, something that should not exist. My brain couldn't understand what it was seeing. It was like a shadow, but it had a form at the same time and it was coming closer and closer. A gray mist started to envelop the aircraft. It was almost as if we were flying into a cloud. Only the clouds here were black and red. Jim, do you see that? I asked, my voice shaking. He looked out the window and his eyes widened in terror. Yeah, what is that? The shadowy figure was now just inches away from the plane. It was like it was trying to get inside. I could feel a cold breeze coming through the window, even though the plane was still flying. It was dark and gray and didn't have a proper shape, but it reminded me of the grim reaper that you see in some storybooks. Cold drops of sweat formed on my forehead as the entity or whatever that thing was formed a long finger with a pointed claw and tapped on the window. 
We both screamed in terror as the figure suddenly disappeared. But then we heard a voice. A voice that sounded like it was coming from inside of the plane. I've been waiting for you. Jim and I looked at each other, both of us paralyzed with fear. Who's there? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper, my bravado gone. No one answered, but we could feel a presence in the cockpit, a presence that was not human. The already cold cockpit got colder and I was paralyzed in fear, too scared to turn around. I saw a gray mist fill the cockpit and that was the last thing that I remember before blacking out. When I came to, we were back on Earth and flying over the place where we had encountered the portal or whatever that vortex had been. The rest of the journey was in silence and I have no idea how Jim and I managed to land that aircraft safely. Jim handed in his resignation on the same day but I decided to stay. We recalled the event perfectly but decided to not mention it to anyone. I like my job and I don't want to be sent to the therapist, or even worse, have my license revoked. I drove home, gripping the steering wheel of my Ford pickup in fear, not daring to look behind me. I stopped at a fast food joint and ate in the pickup itself. Once I went home, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still watching me. I had lived alone for the majority of my life and... I had never experienced this feeling before. I went to bed immediately after a shower, but I couldn't make myself fall asleep. After an hour of tossing and turning, I managed to sleep, but my dreams were plagued by the shadowy entity who laughed in my face about not believing in the supernatural and how I would have to pay penance for it. I dreamt that I was trapped in the other dimension and that I had no escape. I woke up, my pillows soaked in sweat despite the air conditioning. I tried to call Jim, only to realize that I didn't have his number. I ate some cornflakes, wondering whom to call. Scrolling through my contacts, and then it hit me. I would call Jackson. Jackson was an investigator in the National Transportation Safety Board, and I had met the guy earlier in the airport. He was a loner like me, and we had hung out a couple of times watching the latest Marvel movies. He wouldn't think that I was slowly going insane anyway, so I called him. Jackson, a guy who was usually light, became serious and told me to stay where I was and to not leave the house. He promised to be there within two hours with his team. I heaved a sigh of relief and finished the last of my coffee and realized that my laptop was in my room. I wanted to check if the company had changed my flight. There was no way that I wanted to fly today until Jackson had sorted this mess out. I went into my room and the door slammed closed behind me. An icy feeling settled in my veins as I looked around. None of the windows were open so it couldn't have been the wind. I crept forward only to stop in my tracks as a gray mist formed in my room. The same gray mist that formed outside our aircraft. I stood paralyzed in fear as a shape started to form out of the gray mist, the shape that formed outside our aircraft yesterday. I stood paralyzed as the thing shot what looked like chains made out of dark gray mist at me and they wrapped around my ankles. The searing pain jolted me into my senses as I yanked my feet out of its clutches. I screamed and turned open the door, hoping that it wasn't locked and thankfully it opened. I closed the door behind me as the thing slammed against it, letting out a guttural howl. I fumbled for my keys, ran into the garage, and climbed into my pickup. I pulled out onto the driveway and stared at my house. Had that thing followed me back from yesterday? If so, maybe it had gotten to Jim as well. My ankles weren't faring any better, they looked like they had gotten burnt and the skin was red and bruised where the chains had touched me. In hindsight, I should have gotten an ice pack from my fridge. I got on the internet and was searching for forums where people have had similar experiences, and I stumbled across this one. Maybe you guys can help me out until Jackson comes. I'm too scared to go back inside. That thing didn't look like it wanted to chat. 
First of all, thank you all so much for your advice. You have no idea how comforting it was to me to sit in that pickup reading all your advice instead of driving myself crazy. My uncle was killing me so I decided to take a bottle of water that I had stored in my pickup and what a cloth that I found inside. I wrapped it over my ankle and that gave me a bit of relief. I contemplated it driving away many, many times, but I always seemed rooted to the spot, my hands refusing to start my pickup. Anyway, after many tense hours of waiting, I finally spotted Jackson's car pull into the driveway, followed by another official-looking Cadillac. Jackson exited the car along with his team who were carrying a duffel bag. I got out of my pickup and I shook his hand. Thanks for coming all the way out here, man, I said, pumping his hand up and down. Jackson nodded towards the two men who were getting out of the Cadillac, and they were quite obviously someone from the government, complete with black suits, ties, and sunglasses. One of the guys had a thick mustache while the other one looked as if he was devoid of any emotion. What a shocker. They stood, waiting for Jackson to do the introductions. Right, so, guys, this is Chris. Chris, these are my two colleagues from the government. Let me guess, I said, feeling a bit bolder. FBI. I can neither confirm nor deny that statement, said the guy with the mustache. Anyway, I'm Daniel and the other guy's John. Yeah, right, like those were the real names anyway. I'm assuming Jackson would have told you everything, I said, gesturing to my house which Jackson's team were now taking photos of. Daniel nodded. He did. So, do you deal with these types of, um, things? I asked him. The reply was the usual. I can neither confirm nor deny that statement. I can make a coffee if you come in, I said looking at Jackson who shook his head. No, Chris, you can't go back inside until we have a look. All right, I said. I need to see if I have been rescheduled from my roster. Don't worry, said John speaking for the first time. We have spoken to your airline captain. An icy finger trailed along my spine. What had these bozos from the government told the airline? Luckily, Jackson saw the look on my face. Don't worry, Chris. We told them that you're doing some work for us. I breathed a sigh of relief. Any news about Jim, the co-pilot? And Jim has left the state, said Daniel, shaking his head. We have him under observation as well. Well, whatever you guys are doing, take long, I asked. I didn't want to stay in my driveway and announce to the entire neighborhood that something was up with my house. Jackson looked gloom. We need to take some energy readings here. I think you should go and book yourself a hotel for today. I sighed. Can I at least pack? The suits shook their heads at once. No, Captain. Leave everything as it is. After a final handshake, I got into my pickup and went to the town, searching for a hotel to spend the day in. I had some lunch from a restaurant and checked into a newly built three-star. The room was okay, but as I surveyed the room, I had an unsettling feeling. Don't get me wrong, one of the perks of being an airline pilot is that we get to stay in amazing hotels, but I never experienced this feeling that made the hair on the back of my head stand up. It was as if I were not alone. I shrugged it off and I opened up the curtains. I had no illusions, I was technically trapped here until the G-men told me everything was okay. Jackson had given me a device that he told me to use in an emergency, whatever that meant. I looked at the phone-like device that looked very much like an old Nokia. Maybe I was supposed to press the green call button and the phone would do its magic. Luckily, my phone had full charge, so I closed the curtains, hopped into the comfy bed and decided to watch something on Netflix to pass the time. I nearly dropped the phone as I opened up the app, to be greeted by a picture of a woman smiling like a maniac. I browsed through the movie collection, only to be greeted by horror movie after horror movie. I threw the phone across the pillow and decided to go to sleep. 
As my head hit the pillow, I was greeted by that thing. It covered me with its shadowy presence and laughed in my face as I struggled to escape that dimension. I tried my best to at least see what it looked like, but the only thing I could see were the eyes. The eyes that glowed like they were burning coal. I tried to wake myself up and just as I had had that thought, the entity smiled. Or at least I thought that it had smiled. I woke up suddenly, sweating profusely and tried to move my hand to wipe my forehead. When to my horror, my hands would not move. I tried to move my legs but it seemed like they were made out of lead. My heart leapt out of my chest as I looked at myself and saw that my entire body was covered with grey smoke. Only it didn't feel like smoke, more like if lead were a heavy liquid. Something told me to look at the armchair and let out a whimper of fear. Sitting on it was the thing itself and this time I saw it properly for the first time. Its cloak was made of the same grey mist that covered me and its face was the thing that puzzled me. The face it didn't have a form. Just the burning coal eyes and the mouth with dark grey lips. The thing smiled, revealing jagged, sharp teeth that didn't resemble anything human. Chris, it moaned. The voice sounded like dragging nails on a chalkboard. I tried to cover my ears, only to be reminded that this thing had me in its power. My usually gruff voice came out like the squeak of a mouse. What do you want? I shuddered as the thing smiled showing me even more of its teeth that looked like they were suspiciously covered in blood. Can't you remember? No, no, I'm sorry. I should have slept with that dang emergency phone near me. This thing was going to give me a heart attack soon. Oh, that's too bad. I won't lie, I nearly wet myself as the thing got up from the armchair in the room and came near me but something was happening to its face. It was changing into the face of... Kate? Open up! yelled a voice from outside of the room. NTSB officials, open up! The thing hissed and then vanished, taking the gray smoke with it. The door unlocked and thank God for the hotels these days having emergency overrides. And Jackson walked in looking anxious. What happened? He asked me and I sat up and looked at him. It came again. He looked at me sheepishly. Uh, sorry Chris, that device I gave you to contact me is designed to send a remote alert to us when it detects strange energy. And we keyed it to the anomaly that we found in your house. Speaking of that, I said, opening a soft drink that I found in the minibar. What did you guys find anyway? There's an energy fluctuation in your house, mainly your bedroom, but I want to know more about this entity that visited you today. I told Jackson the entire story and he nodded. God, my mistake. I think it's attached itself to something that you took on that flight. Dude, I stared at him. That could even be my house keys or the keys to my truck. Yeah, that's the thing. Jackson... That thing, it looked a bit like Kate. Jackson paled. I knew that I had him. But before that, let me tell you about Kate. Kate was an absolute goddess of a woman that I met when I had just started working for the airline. She was a pilot herself and worked for a charter airline. I saw her in the airport restaurant and I was immediately in love. I approached her a bit shyly and asked her out and to my great surprise... It worked. We started meeting up for a few coffees and we decided to date. I loved her a lot and I knew that she would be the perfect woman for me and I the perfect man for her. Well, that was until she had vanished. I don't need to tell you how devastated I was. I had never had a successful relationship in high school or college. One that lasted for a long time anyway and to see Kate disappear off the face of the earth... Well, it was heartbreaking. I went to the police, but apparently, a boyfriend reporting an adult missing isn't enough. She's an adult, they said. Her employer had no clue about her disappearance and was concerned. The police agreed to put an alert, but nothing came of it after both of us got involved. 
Months turned into years and so did my hope. Jackson, I said a bit more forcefully. He turned to the window. You're going to hate me after this. The doorbell rang and in came John. He put a hand on Jackson. John had been listening in our conversation. Typical government. Twelve years ago, the NTSB was alerted to a missing aircraft over the Bermuda Triangle. I gripped my armchair tightly. The pilot of that aircraft was Kate. I looked at Jackson. You covered it up. You've been covering up every single disappearance in the Triangle, haven't you? I saw red. I stood up, as if that would do any good, but I was brought back to Earth by Jackson. Help us then. What? John cleared his throat. Help us, Captain. Join us to find Kate and solve the mystery once and for all. Of course I agreed. The unnamed agency spoke to my airline and put me on paid leave and told me not to bring anything with me including my clothes. My pickup key, house key, and tack, even glasses would stay behind. It would only be me. Yeah, this included my phone and laptop. The agency, whoever they were, paid my hotel bill, gave me some new clothes, and even got me some new glasses. They even bought me a new phone, and not a crappy one at that. I'm still in the hotel currently, and I'll be leaving shortly. Jackson and his team don't want to take the risk of flying, so it's eight hours over land. I'm going to fall asleep on the way. It's almost seven o'clock here anyway. I haven't seen even a slight sign of the thing since Jackson and them had left. That was a good sign, right? But only if I knew how wrong I was. I reached into my wallet to take out my credit cards. Yeah, Jackson wanted those as well. His instructions were to cancel them and get new ones posted to some weird looking address. I had effectively given up all my worldly possessions to this unnamed agency. My fingers brushed against the talisman, an object that brought tears to my eyes. Kate had given me it a long time ago, saying that her mom considered it good luck and to those of you who want to know, I hadn't met her parents yet. She was planning on introducing me to them later, well until she disappeared. Anyway, as I took out the talisman, I felt a searing pain in my hand, almost as if it were on fire. I clutched my hand and I dropped the thing on the floor, where the gray mist was leaking from it into the real world. In a panic, I quickly called Jackson. Daniel barged into my room. I was to have no privacy, it seemed, and the minute that he came in, the gray mist miraculously disappeared. Daniel nodded. Now I'm going to stay in the room if you don't mind, and we'll take care of the talisman. Yeah, whatever, man. I need to wash my face a bit. I went into the washroom, and a strong sense of foreboding greeted me. I stopped suddenly. Was that a gray mist leaking through the ventilation duct? I slowly turned towards the mirror and nearly shat myself. The thing was right behind me, smiling with an all-too-wide grin. I quickly grabbed the hairdryer. Yeah, I know, but that was the only thing that I could find to defend myself, but there was nobody there. What the heck? I looked in the mirror and to my utter disbelief, the thing appeared to be behind me in the reflection. Daniel, in here. Daniel rushed to the washroom, but predictably, the thing smiled smugly and vanished. Daniel had a very unwelcome explanation. Uh, sorry, Captain, the entity appears to be attached to something of yours. Is it the talisman? Daniel frowned. No, Captain, we can't say for sure, but I think it's something in this room. Can't you find out which it is? Uh, no, Captain, not until we test every single thing you took on that plane. Yeah, right, I can't even take a dump alone without that thing bothering me. Jackson agreed to move the timeline up and we leave in ten minutes. I have a strong feeling the suits won't let me contact anyone once I'm inside their facility, so you won't be hearing from me for a while. I'm going to find out what happened to Kate, even if it means walking into hell myself. Jackson and his friends from the NTSB took me to an undisclosed facility in God knows where. I'm not joking, I spent the better part of the seven hour journey napping and guess what? That thing didn't plague me at all. 
I guess the theory of it being attached to something I took on that flight was true after all. Anyway, we arrived at the office of the NTSB. The security had a look at Jackson and the suit's IDs and after giving me a one over, my driver's license was under their custody anyways. They waved us through. Instead of going through the front door like normal people would, the crew went into a subterranean garage. They parked the Cadillac and we went into an elevator. And Jackson surprised me by inserting a card into a card reader. The lift knew where to go as it started to descend and no, the digital display didn't indicate the floor numbers. I had a sneaking suspicion that we were going to a highly secretive facility that only a few people knew about and I was proven right as the elevator doors opened. And we piled into a dimly lit lobby and were greeted by a big made man. Welcome Team Bravo, I see you've returned with our guest. Yes, boss, said Daniel. The boss smiled back at Jackson. Can't say I'm surprised. Congrats on the promotion, Jackson. Thank you, boss. And do forgive me, Captain, he said looking at me. We were unable to shake anyone's hands as it can cause issues with the energy fluctuations. And you can call me boss. All right, boss, I said, trying to be a part of the team. The boss was satisfied with our answers and nodded at Jackson, who no doubt was the leader of Team Bravo. Jackson told us to follow him and went down a corridor that had several doors set into it. We opened one and were greeted by an apartment. Did I forget to mention that there were no windows by any chance? I guessed that we were underground. We, or rather the G-men, dumped their equipment on the floor and faced me. Jackson raised his hands. You might be having a lot of questions that will answer. Fine, I said, first of all, who are you guys? And Daniel was the one that answered. We are a division of the NTSB known as Edo or the Extraordinary Divisions Organization and we answer directly to the Pentagon. We research anomalies reported by anybody focusing on transportation. I turned to Jackson. Hold on, buddy. I'm pretty sure you were just an NTSB inspector last time that I checked. Jackson shrugged. And that was until I got promoted. Heck, that's why we didn't tell you anything until you signed the NDA. Yeah, well, I just broke it. John opened up the duffel bag and took out a pack of what looked like a computer monitor. Truth be told, Captain, we're very, very interested in the Bermuda Triangle and this is the first time we've experienced anyone with, um, after effects. So what's the plan? I asked him sitting on the sofa. The G-men shrugged. We're on quarantine. We need to be in this decontamination chamber for a few hours until the boss man briefs us. Wow, I was stuck with these guys for another couple of hours. Jackson assured me that his old team was taking care of the belongings that I had left behind and that I would only have to ask to get something provided to me. And this was early in the morning so I decided to take a nap. The apartment had two rooms and I decided to bunk with Jackson. I slept soundly without the thing disturbing my peace. We were called down for breakfast and the boss informed us that we were to be present at 9.30 in the briefing room sharp. That was fine with me. 9.30 saw us in a normal conference room set up with a smart board and a couple of chairs. The four of us along with the boss whose name no one knew and a couple of people in what looked like military uniforms were present at the briefing. The boss started to speak at first, his deep voice resonating in the small room. Ladies and gentlemen, as you are all aware by now, our primary focus is the Bermuda Triangle. The smart board flickered to life, highlighting the area on the map. The pilot, Captain Chris, and his first officer, Jim, of Redacted Airlines experienced something that interests us greatly. Captain, why don't you explain what happened? I stood up and recounted the story, secretly hoping that nobody laughed at me or that I was secretly in a psych hospital. Everybody's faces, however, displayed either horror or shock. Jackson cleared his throat. For the record, everyone, Jim recounts no sightings of the entity except the initial encounter. We have concluded that the entity has anchored itself to a possession of the captains that he took on that flight. 
I raised my hand. Captain? Wait, you government types seriously believe this? The boss smiled and motioned a guy in a lab coat, a scientist, to speak to us. The scientist stood up and went to the podium. All right, folks, to answer your question, Captain, we believe in the laws of energy thoroughly. We have observed that there is a slight anomaly in the area of the Bermuda Triangle. In terms of this energy, when Jackson here reported your incident to his superiors, we were ordered to step in. We have found that the energy signature of your house is different to these surroundings, suggesting that something extraordinary is going on. So nothing paranormal? I asked him cautiously. The scientist smiled. I'm afraid not, Captain. It's all to do with the energy. Well, then what about the flight then? That place we went to? I asked him. Don't blame me, I came here to find answers. The scientist looked a bit less sure of himself. That is still under observation, to be honest. The boss motioned for the scientist to sit down and dominated the podium once again. What we are interested in is this entity that you spoke about, Captain. We have been observing the triangle for the past few years and yet, we haven't observed such energy spikes as we are now. We are testing your belongings for traces of residual energy, but it is still under progress. For the benefit of Team Bravo, said another military-type man, we managed to borrow a satellite that is recording every single thing that's going on in that area. We will keep observing the energy fluctuations and brief you once we're done. That's it, gentlemen. The briefing left me confused and tossing and turning in my bunk bed. Was there such a huge amount of energy that could create another world? I didn't buy it for a second. The science team had a breakthrough after two weeks. The higher-ups were oppressing the boss. They needed the satellite back. I don't know how to explain this, he said calling us to the office, but the talisman seems to have another energy signature emitting from it. Kate believed in it a lot, I said a bit angrily. She should have worn that thing when she went over the triangle the day she went missing. Maybe she would have survived. I poured over the NTSB records for the incident, by the way, and nothing on that three-page folder told me anything useful, other than the time and day she had gone on the flight which I bought the attention of the boss. He surveyed the four of us. I want you, Team Bravo, to take up the challenge of finding out what goes on in the triangle. Our analysts have informed me that on the night of the full moon, at precisely 9.39pm, a sharp spike only for a fraction of a second at a particular point in the triangle occurs. Let me guess, boss, says Daniel. It coincided with the captain's flight path. The boss pointed his pen at Daniel. a boy. Sir, began John a bit fearfully. You're not suggesting that we fly into the triangle, are you? The boss grinned, but I am. The things escalated pretty fast from that point onward. The full moon was approaching in a week and we had to be prepared. Strangely enough, the talisman didn't burn me when I held it this time, leading Jackson to suggest that maybe something that I had in my wallet at the time was triggering it. The science team had several opinions that the triggers were the stuff that I kept in my wallet. Anyway, we exercised and geared up as the military team would say for that day as it loomed closer. The team would be the four of us, three grunts and the two pilots. The boss and the science team would run the ground ops from the base. Oh, and before you ask, no, I still had no idea where we were. I slept on the way mostly. I suspect the G-men might have spiked my coffee, but at least I got good free food here. On the day of departure, we loaded our backpacks, double-checked our communications equipment, and ran a bunch of last-minute checks. My jaw dropped when the boss led us to the hangar. We were to fly on one of the aircrafts in development, something that defied all explanation. It looked like an alien craft with its slim and sleek design. It looked like a cross between a plane and a helicopter, and I admired its stealthy-looking design. The boss was nervous. Uh, the Pentagon wasn't happy about loaning this bad boy. 
Try not to get a scratch on it, huh? The interior was exactly like the exterior of the aircraft. Plush leather seats that looked like they belonged on a luxury jet awaited us and of course, me being me couldn't resist checking out the cockpit. Let's be very clear here, there are two types of pilots in their late 40s like me. Pilots who hate computerized modern pilot cockpits and prefer the old style gauge type systems. And the other ones who love the computerization and digital screens. That was me. For the life of me, I couldn't understand why on earth anyone would want to read off the gauges that took ages to find. Anyway, I was blown away by the sheer design of it all. Large digital displays surrounded the pilots, who had joysticks to control the aircraft. I gave the pilots the thumbs up and went to join the team. After a final comm check of our gear, we got the all clear to take off. The takeoff was extremely smooth and once in the air, the pilot grinned at us. I don't know if anybody told you, but this baby can reach almost three times the speed of sound. So buckle up, gents, and we're flying at 40,000 feet to avoid the other aircraft. Wow, said Daniel, clapping his hands. We'll be there in no time then. I looked at the team. I had gotten to know them well during the two weeks, and Daniel was an outgoing guy. Jackson was, well, Jackson, but John spoke only when necessary, and that wasn't much. Anyways, once we had reached our cruising altitude, Jackson sent the grunts to the cockpit. There was something that he wanted to tell us and only us. He indicated that we switch off our comms and just said in a grave voice. I'm not buying that energy explanation for a second. There's something sinister going on there and we needed to stop at all costs. Got it? He looked hard at me and I nodded. Roger. The other men followed with John simply nodding. The NTSB had provided us with what they called energy blasters, which shot superheated plasma at anything that it encountered. I had a feeling that the aircraft was fitted with something equally frightening as well. And in case you were wondering, I being a private citizen was not allowed to carry the firearm, but I had the talisman with me. Something equally dangerous. I noticed a change in the pitch of the engines and the pilots called over the intercom stating that we were a couple of miles away from insertion into the triangle. We buckled our seatbelts and waited for the inevitable. The aircraft jolted suddenly to the right and we looked at each other in grim determination. This was it. I looked outside as the aircraft suddenly rightened itself. Wow, said Jackson looking mesmerized by the clouds starting to form a vortex slowly spinning and gaining speed. I looked at my watch. It was 9.39. The aircraft started to shudder as the pilots engaged the corrective actions. In my defense, I didn't have the privilege of practicing this maneuver 1,000 times in the simulator when I did it. What the heck is that? shrieked one of the grunts. We looked outside and sure enough, the portal to hell was forming once again. All the pilots said was, Brace yourself, we're going in. The nose of the aircraft tipped towards the vortex as the engine screamed bloody murder. We shot like a bullet towards the vortex and I closed my eyes. The shuddering stopped and we were in the calm once again. Jackson was speechless. The energy spike must be creating a rip in space-time. It looks like hell, said Daniel shuddering. Can you control this thing? I asked the pilots who looked gloomily at me. The controls aren't responding anymore. We've lost contact with ground, said a grunt who was updating everybody back at base. At once, the mist started to form outside the plane and, as discussed earlier, the pilots eased it onto the red, rocky soil. We waited in silence until the mist intensified and the temperature dropped rapidly. No one was ready for what happened next. Of course, the thing appeared inside the plane. The thing didn't care about the rifles that were aimed at it. It just smiled, showing off those pointy teeth. Ooh, you came back, it said. State your purpose, commanded Jackson forcefully. The thing looked at him. Chris shall remain here. I need him, 
Where is Kate? At the mention of the word, something happened to the thing. Its featureless face changed into the sweet face of Kate, with its burning coal eyes turning into her deep blue eyes. I was at a loss for words. Kate, I said, almost running to hug her. Daniel held out an arm, stopping me. Oh, Chris, darling, said Kate, tears starting to form in her eyes. You need to leave, please. This entity will take you too. I can't leave you, I whispered. The talisman, said John's voice. I looked at the usually emotionless guy and was shocked to see his face. He looked sad and almost looked like he was fighting back tears. This was the first time that I had seen him express any sort of emotion. Hey, gimme, said Kate. I could see that she was fighting to control her human body. This thing feeds off humans, Chris. Every soul who comes to this dimension is doomed. Please give me the talisman. Free us all. I handed her the talisman with shaking fingers and screamed a cry of agony as she plunged it into her chest. John fainted on the floor of the plane, surprising Daniel. There was a guttural roar as the dark gray mist poured out of Kate's chest and the thing appeared, its eyes burning with hate. But the talisman had done its job. The thing faded into oblivion but not before giving me a parting souvenir. As it tried to grab a hold of me, a smoky tentacle wrapped around me that felt like lava on my skin. Unsurprisingly, we tried to figure out a way to get back into our dimension until Jackson had noticed that the portal was open. The pilots used the vector thruster engines to turn us around and we were back on Earth. Oh, and you want to know what that souvenir the thing gave me was now, don't you? I was proud of my skin, but contact with the thing in it had given me a grayish mark on my forearm, where the tentacle had made contact, almost like a brand. After getting debriefed and warned not to share my story with anyone, I wanted to find out what John's involvement was with this. I asked him just as he had dropped me off at my house. He looked at me like I was the dumbest person on earth. Kate's my sister. I've been flying as a bush pilot in Alaska for the last five years or so. It's a pretty good job for the right sort of person. It goes without saying that you need to be a pretty handy pilot. Specifically of small and light aircraft, but beyond that, it also requires a special sort of personality. Folks who thrive on social interaction and the safe comfort of civilization need not apply. Being self-sufficient and mechanically inclined are pretty much prerequisites for those who want to stay on this side of the grave. And I would say that it's fairly important that you have a level head and don't have a tendency to panic in stressful situations. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about thrill seekers or those who don't have a healthy respect for death. Those folks don't tend to last too long in this business. They either end up as another in the long list of missing planes that gains new entries each year, or else they quickly learn that their employers aren't willing to risk their expensive equipment and cargo with somebody that isn't going to take every possible precaution to ensure the safe return of said aircraft. I'm just saying that you have to be able to set your fears aside when you're in the thick of it. If something goes wrong, you need a clear head. You can always puke your pass out once you're safely on the ground again. I've had my fair share of cold sweats, standing on a frozen runway after a close brush with the afterlife. But for me, I'm a transplant from South Florida, where I spend much of my time doing puddle jump charters in a small twin engined beach craft. Interesting share. The dealing with people has never been my strong suit. I'm not exactly the sociable sort, even less though when I'm trying to fly. When you've got four passengers sitting a couple of feet behind you and expecting you to play tour guide on their two hour flight across the Everglades, it gets old pretty quick. Or at least it did for me. I guess it works for some people. 
Anyway, a flying buddy of mine that I hadn't talked to in years called me up out of the blue one day with a lead on an open seat at the Bush Charter Company that he had been working with out of Fairbanks. One of their pilots had decided that the harsh Alaskan winters and isolation were more than his nerves could take. So he gave his notice, packed up his bags, and he headed back south. Truth be told, I had never really considered looking for a gig in Alaska. I always had the impression that most of the bush pilots working there had been flying stole. That's a short takeoff and landing. In the backcountry since, they were old enough to walk. Nick assured me that there were plenty of respected pilots up there who had originated from the lower 48. When he had floated the salary numbers in my direction, I didn't take too long thinking about it before I had made my decision. And two weeks later, I found myself standing in the offices of my new employer. And that was a while back and although it took a bit to become accustomed to the type of bush flying that this place demands, I settled in pretty quick and was soon assigned my permanent ride. A De Halavand DHC2 Beaver. Maggie after a yellow lab I had as a kid. And man, what a beauty she is. Solar yellow with black piping and looking just as pristine as when she rolled off the assembly line in 1967. The beaver is probably the best bush plane to ever grace the skies. And I'm fairly certain that Maggie saved my butt from a stupid mistake on more than one occasion. Anyway, I'm getting off track. So at the time this story took place... I had been flying for Viking bush charters for probably a year or so. I had just returned from dropping supplies to a ranger station up near Denali when I got a call over the radio from my dispatcher. I was in the hangar at the time getting a hot cup of coffee while the mechanic was refitting Maggie with her Tundra tires, swapping out the floats that I would need for the supply drop off earlier. The big, almost cartoonish tires were perfect for most of the areas that I tended to fly in, and it made for a soft, if energetic, landing. I was looking forward to getting back to my trailer and relaxing, maybe watching a movie before dozing off. But the crackle from my two-way told me that my exciting plan for the night might not play out. Go for Hooper, I answered, taking a sip of the steaming coffee. The voice of Buck Jacobs replied through the light static. Hey Hoop, what's your status? Uh, Mike is working on Maggie's gear and I was getting ready to head home for the evening. What's up? There was a moment's pause before Buck replied. Uh, sorry Hoop, but I need you to do a turnaround. We just got a call from a ranger station up near Birch Creek. They've got somebody up there that had a run-in with a brown bear and is pretty banged up. I cursed under my breath, but there wasn't any real venom in it. I learned a while ago that up here, everybody helps when it's needed. You never know when it's going to be you on the other side of that call. Can't they fly them out themselves? I asked, but I was already walking around my plane to where Mike Nichols was working. Ah, negative, Hoop. It's an emergency and we're the nearest phone call. I would send Jackie, but she's not back from a run-up to Minto yet. He replied. Okay, Buck, no worries. I'll help Mike get Maggie refitted and prepped. I should be wheels up in an hour or so, I said. Thanks, Hoop. I'll have the details in your hands in 15. Dispatch out. And there went my relaxing evening. True to my prediction, I was taxiing down the company's private runway an hour later. The vibration from the big radial engine creating a gentle thrumming that filled the interior. It was just before 3 p.m. when I was airborne, and being that it was late February, I knew that I had just over two hours before sunset. So long as everything went smoothly, that should have been enough time to reach the ranger station, load up the passenger, and get back to Fairbanks before dark. The weather was pretty good when I had left. It was pushing plus 10 degrees and although the reports were calling for snow that evening, the sky was clear as I rose above the trees and turned northeast towards the ranger station. Everything was going smoothly for the first 30 minutes, before those distant storm clouds that I had been watching on the horizon suddenly seemed to take a keen interest in me 
and headed my way much faster than I would have liked. To make matters worse, I had started to notice a subtle bumping sensation intermittently coming from the engine. I wasn't sure if I was starting to lose one of the nine cylinders or if it was something else, but it was definitely something that I was keeping my eye on. If I had been on a regular supply run, I would have turned around and headed back to Fairbanks right there and then to get it checked out. But I was acutely aware that anyone who had a tangle with a grizzly was probably in a bad way. My flight out to the Birch Creek Ranger Station may very well mean the difference between life and death for this unfortunate soul. After another 15 minutes, I knew that I wasn't going to make it to the Ranger Station. The storm clouds that had been approaching had now overtaken me and covered the afternoon sky in a thick blanket of gray and black ugliness. I could see the periodic flashes of lightning within them, and the air had grown turbulent. To make matters worse, that engine mist that I had been feeling had become more frequent and severe, and I was sure that I now had multiple cylinders that were beginning to fail. I grabbed the VHF and radioed back to dispatch. Viking ground, Viking 320 Foxtrot. Buck's voice crackled a thrill a moment later. Viking 320 Foxtrot, Viking ground, reading you hoop. Hey Buck, I've run into some nasty weather here and have started picking up some engine issues. I'm afraid that I'm going to have to abort and head for home. Please advise Birch Creek Ranger Station of my situation. Buck didn't argue. He knew that I wouldn't abort a pickup like this for a few snow flurries. Roger that, Hoop. Looking at the weather radar right now. Advise you make your heading 185 degrees and drop to 900 to avoid the worst of it. Roger that. Viking 320 Foxtrot out, I said, banking the plane to the right and starting my return to the airfield. The storm front which had overtaken me from my left had also descended with its approach, bringing the clouds low and thick. I pushed forward on the yoke, starting my descent to Buck's recommendation and hoping that there weren't any errant mountains in my way. Five minutes later, I was fighting with the wind for control of Maggie and was now nearly in a whiteout condition, relying almost exclusively on my instruments for navigation. The turbulence was getting severe, tossing the workhorse bush plane around like a kite in a gale. More than once, the groaning of the wing struts made me wonder if the storm was pushing Maggie past her comfort zone and testing the limits of her airframe. I descended a bit more, dropping to 500 feet, aware that in these low visibility conditions, I was pushing my luck with the terrain. The air was a little cleaner down here though, and the visibility a little better, but I was still being thrown around and I knew that I would have to climb again pretty soon in order to clear the ridge line. I knew that was not too far ahead of me. An unnerving metallic popping noise from above my head drew my attention momentarily. And in that moment, I made the decision that I had to find a place to set her down and wait out the storm as best I could. The trees below me were becoming very visible now at this altitude. Their peaks piercing the low cloud cover and heavy snowfall like ghostly claws, reaching up from the depths of some abyssal grave to drag me down. The biggest issue that I faced now was finding a suitable place to land safely. I knew that the winds had pushed me off course and I wasn't as familiar with this area as most others I spent time flying over. I wasn't aware of any landing strips nearby and I was just praying to find a large enough clearing to accommodate her. Another engine miss. Worse this time. This time, the strained drone of the radio cut out completely for a half second before resuming. And for the first time since I had come to Alaska... I realized that there was a very real possibility that I might not make it home. If the engine died completely in what was now a strong tailwind, my airspeed would quickly drop until one of my wings stalled. When that happened, the beaver would wing over and I would tumble to the ground in an irrecoverable death spiral. It might be months or years before my wreckage was discovered out here in the wilderness. I considered trying to turn into the wind to keep as much airspeed as possible in that event. But it was gusting bad enough that I was afraid to attempt it, 
especially with a limping engine. I was getting ready to radio dispatch and let Buck know of my worsening situation when the thick of clouds parted ahead of me briefly. In an instant, I thought that I had won the most important lottery of my life. Directly ahead of me, a quarter mile out, was the unmistakable rectangular shape of a small airstrip. It was covered in snow that I hoped wasn't too deep, but it was my salvation, a lifeline that I wouldn't dare refuse. I quickly adjusted my approach and set my flaps as I made for it. Another strong gust fought me, trying to throw me out of alignment with the narrow clearing, but I fought back with throttle and rudder as best as I could. As I watched the altimeter steadily wind down like an analog clock going backwards in time, I reached out for the radio handset to advise Buck of my situation and estimated location, but the next gust almost tore the yoke out of my left hand, and I snapped instantly back to a white-knuckled, two-handed grip. My altitude dropped to 200 feet. I was going too fast, I knew. At this speed, I would either overshoot the strip altogether and slam into the dense tree line, or hit the ground so hard that I would shear off my gear and probably break my back in the process. I couldn't slow down any further though, or I would risk dropping below stall speed in the strong tailwind, and that would mean a quick trip to the frozen ground. A hundred feet. Maggie's wings dipped below the tree line now as I entered the long and narrow swath of the landing strip, the tall cedars and spruces towering around me forebodingly. The tailwind dropped, obstructed by the great barrier of trees behind me, and I took a breath to thank whatever powers that be for this unexpected bit of good fortune. Fifty feet. With the flaps set to full, I bled off airspeed quickly and my reflexes took over transitioning from my near-ballistic flight to a more controlled approach, one the beaver was much more suited to. Ten feet. I pulled back on the yoke and momentarily throttled up as my gear kissed the top of the snow, flaring the bush plane and setting down a bit harder than I would have liked, the jarring of the impact thankfully cushioned by the tundra tires. I rolled out for another 20 feet or so before Maggie came to a halt in the knee-deep snow, thankful that I had it nosed over. I killed the engine and rested my forehead on the yoke, trying to get my heart rate under control. I didn't think the shaking in my hands had anything to do with the temperature. The daylight was fading, but it was still light enough to allow me a good view of my surroundings through Maggie's windows. I was in the middle of what I guessed was the landing strip, since the tree lines on either side seemed to be about the same distance from me. Those trees were even more imposing down here in the ground. They rose like towering walls on either side, and the woodlands beyond held deep shadows that were only accentuated by the heavy snowfall that continued to obscure my vision. I reached for the radio and I keyed the mic, hailing dispatch. I didn't have much faith that the VHF would be able to penetrate the trees and the mountain ridge that lay between me and Buck, but it was worth a shot. After a long moment of hissing static, I tried again, but with the same results. It was doubtful that I would be able to get a signal through until the storm had passed, and even then, I didn't think it likely unless I could get Maggie airborne again. With only a moment's deliberation and a resigned sigh, I retrieved the emergency locator beacon from my jacket pocket and I activated it. The unit would broadcast at a stress signal along with my location to the monitoring service. I knew that it would be a day at least before any help arrived, but the sooner that I sent the call, the sooner they would be able to get to me. I took another look out through the fuse lodge windows. If there was a landing strip, that meant a possibility that somebody was nearby. I didn't think there was a ranger station out here, but there were enough hunting cabins and homesteads that there was a decent chance that I could find shelter. The interior of the plane was still warm, but I knew that wouldn't last very long in this weather, especially with night approaching. I unbuckled myself and climbed back through the seats into the cargo area, where I pulled on my heavy coat and shouldered my emergency pack. 
grabbing my rifle from its rack behind the pilot seat, I unlatched and swung open the cargo door. A blast of arctic wind hit me in the face, and I squinted my eyes against it, quickly pulling my goggles out of my hood up before I dropped into the snow-covered runway. I pulled the cargo door closed and trudged around the rear of the plane, standing in the furrows left by Maggie's wheels and turning in a slow circle as I tried to discern any indication of human presence. Despite the howling wind that pulled at my coat and hood, I caught the unmistakable scent of wood smoke and breathed a small sigh of relief. At least I know I wasn't alone out here. As I scanned my surroundings, my eyes alighted on what looked like a small utility shed on the western edge of the clearing, and I moved with as much speed as the deep snow would allow in its direction. To the left of it, I spied a waist-high railing marking a walkway that led into the shadowed tree line and quickened my pace. I followed the trail, now feeling what were likely wooden planks beneath my boots. Once in the trees, the brutal wind of the storm had lessened and the snow drifted down from the canopy in slow, dancing swirls before settling on the ground with a muted hiss that sounded like the forest around me was quietly exhaling. Between the dim light of the coming dusk and the snowfall, I couldn't see much beyond the trees nearest me and I relied on the handrail to guide my travel. It was another few minutes of plodding through the snow-covered walkway before I finally saw the building. At first, I thought it was a hunting cabin, solitary amidst the endless sea of trees. As I drew closer, though, I could see that it was much larger than I had first thought, low and wide and of modern construction. Some sort of sign stood between two timber uprights just off the path, its face covered in snow and ice. I paused to brush it clear, somewhat surprised to see the blue background and logo of the Alaskan Division of Agriculture. White lettering beneath it indicated that this was the White River Basin Agricultural Research Center. I had never heard of the ADOA having wilderness research centers, but I supposed it wasn't too far-fetched. Regardless, this was even better news than I had expected. This meant that I wasn't approaching some isolated hunting cabin, but instead a government post. And that meant my chances of survival and rescue had just increased significantly. I gave a hoot of joy and patted the sign, as if it were an old friend who had just delivered some good news. And I jogged the remaining handful of yards to the front door of the building. Just as I had approached, however, the door abruptly swung open, spilling yellow light across the white snow. A man stepped out from the doorway and shouldered a shotgun, leveling it right at my head, his eyes wide and wild as they stared down the barrel at me. Stop right there, he shouted at me, his words coming in angry puffs of steam in the frigid air. Don't come any closer. Whoa, hold on a minute, chief, just wait. I answered, my hands going up reflexively. I'm not here to cause any trouble. He motioned with the shotgun. Drop the rifle, nice and slow. I'm warning you, I won't hesitate to blow you in half if you make any sudden movements. Holding my free hand up to show that I wasn't a threat, I bent slowly and placed the rifle on the ground before rising again. What's going on? Who are you? What are you doing here? He demanded. I could see the muzzle of the shotgun trembling and worried that he might end up shooting me by mistake just due to nerves. He was wearing what looked like a government issued coat with an embroidered patch on the shoulder and he had a week's growth of beard. Easy boss, I said, trying to keep my voice level and calm. My name's Hooper. I'm a pilot for Viking Bush Charters out of Fairbanks. My plane was forced down in the storm and I was lucky to find your landing strip before she ended up in the trees. I was starting to wonder if lucky was the right word anymore. He looked at me after a long minute, his eyes scanning me over and then motioned at me again with the shotgun. Take off your goggles. Let me see your eyes, he said. That caught me off guard. But I nodded and slowly moved my hands to remove the tinted goggles. 
careful to not make any sudden moves. He leaned towards me, eyes locked hard on mine searchingly. Then, seemingly satisfied, he abruptly lowered his gun and nodded, as if reassuring himself. He jerked his head back toward the doorway, and his entire demeanor had suddenly changed. Well, Hooper, come on inside and bring your rifle. It's too cold out here. With that, he turned and walked back inside, resting the shotgun against the interior wall next to the door as he did so. Now even more confused than before, I reached down and picked up my rifle from the snowy ground, my gaze never leaving the man. As inconspicuously as I could, I worked the lever, chambering a cartridge, and I followed him in. It was such a bizarre interaction. I wanted to make sure he wouldn't surprise me again if he decided to change his mind. When I entered the building and closed the door behind me, I found myself in what looked like a wood-paneled visitor's room, with a couch on one wall and a blazing fireplace, fronted by a couple of chairs on the opposite. The man had moved over to a small table near the fireplace, pouring a glass of whiskey from a half-empty bottle, and now seemingly completely disinterested in my presence. I frowned and glanced around the room. Aside from these sparse furnishings, there was a closed door across from the one that I had entered through, labeled with a restricted access sign. I followed him as he pushed the door open and proceeded along a narrow, tiled corridor lit by harsh, fluorescent lights. It felt out of place, more like I was walking through the halls of a hospital than an ADOA building in the middle of the bush. He looked over his shoulder and took note of my surprise. Yeah, not quite like the ranger stations, is it? He said, stopping in front of a heavy-looking door at the end of the corridor and keying a quick code into the panel above the handle. I heard a soft click and he pushed it open exposing a darkened room beyond. He entered and the lights flickered on as I followed. The room that we now stood in was larger than the previous one, probably 30 feet across and smelling of antiseptic and chemicals. Several rows of stainless steel tables were neatly arranged within, occupied with various unfamiliar laboratory paraphernalia and equipment. In addition to these lab stations, there also appeared to be examination tables along the far wall, a few of which had white cloths covering unidentifiable shapes. I suppressed a shudder. It reminded me of a morgue, though the concealed objects were too small to be human bodies. What is this place? I asked, my eyes taking it all in. Just like the sign outside says, Hooper. This is the White River Basin Agricultural Research Center, he replied, leaning against one of the tables. It was set up to monitor large mammal wildlife migrations with potential correlation to climate change. Huh, I replied evenly. Sounds interesting, he grinned. No, it doesn't, not even to me and I work here. Would you believe that a week ago there were 25 researchers living and working here? 25, Hooper. This place was hopping, man. An uncomfortable tingle ran down my spine, and I shifted the rifle in my hand, the weight of it reassuring as it hung at my side. If Tate had noticed, he didn't mention it. What happened last week? I asked carefully. When he turned back to me, the smirk was gone from his face and his eyes had widened. Whatever was in his thoughts now... He didn't find it amusing anymore. That's when they came, Hooper. They. The shadows, man. The shadows. They came from the storm. You remember the storm, don't you? The storm. I knew what he was talking about, of course. I don't think anyone around here would forget it anytime soon. It was a little more than a week ago when that freak blizzard came out of nowhere unpredicted and unexplained. What had started out as a cloudless and unseasonably warm morning ended up burying us in nearly two feet of snow by the time that it was over. The sky had shifted from bright and sunny to a bruised and angry granite color within the span of an hour. Clouds rolling so low and heavy that it seemed like you could almost reach up and touch them. 
our weather station at the field was clocking sustained wind speeds of 50 knots, with gusts up to 85, and we were in total whiteout condition for the next 14 hours. We were all trapped in the hangar huddled around the kerosene jet heaters, listening to the wind as it tried to tear apart the heavy steel structure around us. By the time the next day came, it was just gone, replaced by the clear blue skies of the previous morning. Nobody had any good explanation for it, but I heard a couple of the old timers who ran the machine shop whispering about it in the back. I couldn't make out much of what they were saying. I didn't much care if I'm being honest, but they sounded worried. At the time, I thought it was a little strange that the weather would unnerve them as much as it seemed to. These guys were both full-blood Inuit and as hard as nails. It was almost comical to think that they would be worried about a surprise blizzard. No, now that I think back on it, it almost seemed like they were more worried about something in the blizzard. I can't be sure since they kept switching in and out of English but that's the impression that I got anyway. The shadows? I asked him, confused. His eyes had drifted off into the distance for a moment, lost in his own world. And the next moment, he snapped them back to me eagerly, like he had just had an epiphany, and he said, Yeah, do you want to see one? Do I want to see a shadow? What are you talking about, man? You're not making any sense. But he was already on the move again, walking across the room to another door. He beckoned me to follow, entered his coat, and he pushed it open. Wordlessly, I followed, unease whispering in my ear. He led me along another hallway, glancing over his shoulder periodically like he was making sure that I was still there. I caught one. The other researchers didn't think that it was possible, but I knew that I could. He said, and it almost sounded like he was talking to himself more than to me. He stopped at a door mart, OR2, pushed it open, and walked inside. I trailed behind him hesitantly, feeling apprehensive about this whole thing. A slow feeling of dread had been worming its way through my subconscious, and I wasn't so sure that I wanted to follow this man much further. The whole situation felt wrong, and I was starting to think that Mr. Morgan Tate was more than a little unhinged. Where were the other researchers that he had mentioned? I had questioned whether they even existed at all, if not for the size of the place and the coats hanging by the door in the reception area. The room that I stepped into now was much smaller than the others and had the feel of some sort of control room. The wall to my left held narrow lockers and a rack of coat hooks occupied by several white lab coats. To my right was a console lined with monitors and keyboards and above that, the entire upper portion of the wall appeared to be an observation window looking into a darkened room. On the opposite wall was one of those airlock doors that you see in isolation areas of hospitals, stainless steel and with a small circular window in its smooth surface. The computer monitors were on and were displaying various graphs and streams of data. Tate sat on one of the chairs at the console and started typing into his keyboard. They're incredible, he said absently, like nothing we've seen before. I moved closer to the observation window, straining to make out anything in the darkened room beyond. All I saw was the blackness, though. You have something in there. I asked, suddenly feeling very uncomfortable. I wasn't sure that I wanted to see whatever this nutcase wanted to show me. Why are the lights off? He glanced away from the console for a second and turned an unreadable grin on me. They're not. With that, he stood and leaned forward, pounding the heel of his fist against the window with a resounding shudder, making me jump in surprise. I didn't quite understand what I saw next. The darkness that had obscured my view suddenly swept aside, like somebody snatching a curtain violently from across a window and out of sight. But that wasn't quite right either though. It was more fluid in its abrupt motion, 
almost like smoke being pulled away by an incredibly powerful and unseen exhaust fan. A muted screeching sound reached my ears, sounding eerily like a poor imitation of a bird of prey. I assumed that the observation room was soundproof or near enough, and wondered exactly how wild that wailing must have been for it to reach my ears. I leaned closer to the window, peering upward and to the left, where the darkness had it disappeared to, but I couldn't see any vestige of it. And then I looked to the rest of the room and drew an involuntary gasp at the horror that I saw. A dozen corpses lay strewn about the otherwise barren interior of the room, but they weren't bodies anymore, not really. They were nothing more than skeletons now, still dressed in the clothes that they had worn when they fell. Most were intact, though a few had scattered where they struck the tiled floor. Their bones were stripped of all remnants of flesh and were bleach white. What the heck? I said in revulsion and shock, barely above a whisper. Tate nodded excitedly. It's incredible, isn't it? The others left, but I was able to lure two of them into the holding room and trap them here. I stepped back, feeling my stomach turned and turned an incredulous gaze upon the man. But the bodies... He nodded again almost eagerly. That's how I lured them. Most of the remaining researchers fled in here to hide. You see, it needs to eat, to hunt. It can't survive without sustenance. No more than you or I. There were two in the beginning, but after the food ran out... This one turned on the other, and now there's only one. The food? You mean those people? I tightened the grip on my rifle, then took a step backwards to put a little space between the two of us. When the shadows came in the darkness of the storm, a few of them were able to slip into the building before we realized what was happening. Half of the researchers were taken that night in their sleep. You see, they hide and wait for the right moment. They avoid the light, I think it weakens them, but in the darkness, he trailed off, and I saw an uncomfortable smile grow across his lips, almost of admiration it seemed. In the darkness, that's where they live, that's where they thrive, and where they reign. I took another step backwards, my free hand reaching for the door handle behind me and opening it, pushing it with my foot. You're crazy, I said, bringing the rifle up in line with his chest. If he even noticed it, he gave no indication. His eyes had taken on that maniacal glint again, and he stood, giving a small nod that I thought was meant to reassure me. There's no more for it to eat, Hooper. It's been days since I've been able to feed it. He took a slow step towards me, and I matched it with a retreating one of my own. He smiled and continued as if explaining to a child. I have only myself left to offer, but that's not enough. Don't you understand? This isn't just a thing, not just an animal. It's far beyond our understanding. Far beyond our own primitive evolution. It's perfect. His eyes flicked away from me for a moment to an illuminated red button on the console nearby, and his hand drifted over to it. Don't, I shouted, bringing the rifle up to my shoulder. Don't do it, Tate. There's nothing to be afraid of, he said, an obscene caricature of gentleness filling his voice. It's quick. His hand hovered over the button. I will shoot you, Tate. Don't make me do it. From where I stood, I could see another one of those airlock doors through the observation window and, to my horror, a swirling mass of impenetrable blackness massed at the threshold. I could almost feel its anticipation. This wasn't the first time that it had been fed. It knew what was coming. In that instant, when my eyes had flicked away from him, Tade stabbed at the button. With a curse, I squeezed the trigger on the rifle at the same instant, but it was too late. The deafening rapport in the small room was immense, but even as the round tore through the man's chest, he had already pressed it. I watched in horror as the twin airlock doors began to retract, and without another thought, I turned and fled as fast as my wary muscles could carry me. Thankfully, the codes required to open the doors weren't needed to exit them, 
and I flew down the hall and through the research room. As I passed it and threw open the door to the reception area, I heard that wailing screech again from somewhere behind me, haunting and otherworldly, echoing through the empty facility much louder than before. Then I heard another sound, this one the agonized screaming of Morgan Tate. I only gave it the briefest of thoughts as I jerked open the outer door and fled into the snowstorm. I could only hope that feeding time would give me enough of a window to make it back to Maggie. The air had darkened even more with the coming of dusk and it had grown colder. Thankfully, the storm seemed to have lost much of its fury, the front having now passed by and leaving me in its relatively calm wake. I ran along the path, just enough light remaining of the day to follow the tracks that I had made on my way in. The rifle was heavy in my grip, but I didn't dare lose my only defense. When that howling screech echoed through the trees behind me, I redoubled my speed, praying that it wouldn't be able to find me before I reached Maggie. The frigid air burned my lungs and my throat was raw by the time that I had reached the snow-covered landing strap. I almost cried with joy at the sight of my bright yellow Maggie waiting patiently for my return. I reached the cargo hatch and swung it open, throwing myself inside and pulling it shut behind me, just as another one of those haunting wails had reached my ears, only closer this time. Much closer. I didn't dare look out the windows as I threw off my pack and rifle and climbed back into the pilot seat. I buckled on my harness and my hands danced over the controls. The startup procedure second nature. Battery master on, fuel selector to center, mixture lever forward, fuel oil shutoff lever down. A resounding high-pitched howl penetrated the cabin and something black had moved outside, rushing from window to window, door to door searching. It was here now and trying to find a way inside. Concentrate. Throttle at 10%, fuel pressure pumped to 5 psi, engine primed. I froze. My windshield had suddenly gone completely black, shrouding me in darkness. Even though I couldn't see anything in the feature of this void just a foot away from my face, I could feel its desperation. I felt its sightless gaze and below that, some dark malice, an inhuman and alien hunger. I pressed the starter switch and the 9-cylinder radial engine started turning over, only slowly at first, laggard and sluggish. My blood chilled as I realized that it wasn't catching, it wasn't starting. My thoughts flew back to the engine problems that I had been experiencing before my emergency landing, and in that moment I was certain that my luck had finally run out. But then, a backfire and then another and then a third, coughing black puffs of smoke from the exhaust. And then it caught, and that big and beautiful Pratt & Whitney radio took over the loud drone rising smooth and steady as Maggie awoke from her slumber. I pushed the throttle forward, inertia pressing me into my seat. I no longer cared about the engine's misfires or the storm. A fiery death in the trees was preferable to whatever that thing had in store for me, I was sure. The snow was deep and even with the tundra tires I had to work to keep from nosing over as it began to gain speed. At some point, the black mass had disappeared from my windscreen, and I was greeted with the glorious sight of an open path before me. With the passing of the storm front, the wind had shifted directions, and I was into a headwind now, perfect for my needs. I pushed the throttle to full and pulled back gently on the yoke. I felt the wheels leave the ground, now free from the snow's drag, and I continued my climb up until I was above the trees and gently banking back toward the south, towards home. As I passed over the landing strip, I thought that I could just make out a black shape in the ground below, stretching and snaking along after me in its futile pursuit before I lost it in the trees. The engine miss returned after another ten minutes of flying, but Maggie carried me back to safety. She always took care of me. Forty minutes later, I was back on the ground in Fairbanks in taxi in for the hangar. Stopping the bush plane just outside, I shut her down, unbuckled myself, and carefully climbed down to the runway, where my body fought with itself for which was going to happen first, the puking or the passing out. 
At this point, I would happily suffer either. Mike Nichols came jogging out of the hangar after hearing my approach and helped steady me. Jesus, Hoop, you gave us all a scare. He smiled. Must have been a heck of a fight. Looked like you saw a ghost man. I could only nod and stumble my way towards the warmth of the hangar, grateful for his shoulder to brace myself against. Just before we reached the service door, he paused and looked back at Maggie. Buck had told me you had some engine problems, but he didn't say anything about a fire. I frowned and shook my head. No fire. I lost some cylinders. He stood there a moment longer, an odd expression on his face, before opening the door and ushering me inside. Weird. I thought I saw some black smoke coming from under the engine cowl right after you shut her down. Last year, Bloody Disgusting gave it 4 out of 5 screams. Fangoria touted it as the most original haunted house concept on the market. But you shouldn't believe the reviews. No, really don't. Full Moon Flights is not what it seems. According to the brochure, they are a modern haunted house for fans of fear, a departure from the ordinary and a journey into the unknown where nightmares are inescapable. We don't allow guests to book flights. Instead, we let those who have the courage and curiosity to come find us. The blurb read. Everything about it screamed a publicity stunt to me. A private jetliner filled with costumed actors and jump scares designed to give people an adrenaline rush all night long. The latest event was this Halloween near me. And since I couldn't think of a better way to spend the evening... I decided to take a drive out to the provided coordinates where the plane was said to land. The departure time was scheduled for precisely 12.01am, so I got there early, intent on documenting each and every aspect of the experience. Besides myself, there were about six other cars parked at an old airstrip, a fitting place for the spooky flight to land. I thought as I looked about the dilapidated buildings. No one had used this place in a very long time, if ever. I grabbed my cell and small backpack filled with emergency supplies and gear, everything that I thought I would need for the night. But then from the looks of some of the other patrons' gear, it seemed I was the one underprepared. First time, a woman wearing a Freddy Krueger shirt asked as she offered me a small capsule. Yeah, what's this for? I asked. Helps keep your head in the game. For a little while, anyway. She said as she stared up at the sky. Guess they want to be fashionably late, like usual. How many times have you been a passenger? I asked. I remembered reading that some claimed the event had staff hidden among the guests to try and boost interest. So everything she told me I took with a grain of salt at first. Five times, maybe six. It's a heck of a ride, I'll tell you what. She answered as she extended her hand and added, I'm Isabella. It's nice to meet you. Max, and same here. When are they supposed to arrive? I asked, noticing the other passengers were getting antsy. I couldn't see any signs of a plane in the sky, and wondered what sort of showy entrance the proprietors had in mind to dazzle us. Don't know. These things are unpredictable. She lit a smoke and I wandered toward the other passengers. She tried to sell you one of the pills too, huh? A man asked as I looked down at my palm where the red and white tablet was at. Is it some kind of hallucinogenic? I whispered. I don't know, mate, but I personally wouldn't risk it. This night is probably going to be as crazy enough as it is, he told me. You came all the way from around the world just for this, I asked. He didn't respond, but his eyes showed a story of pain and heartache. He was searching for something, but wouldn't dare disclose what. The others were not as fascinating. Two twins from Manchester were here for a birthday present to each other, and a couple of young reporters finished up our group. Considering the price of tickets for the event, 
I knew that to get their money worth, they all expected an extreme fright. 20 minutes passed and the flight still hadn't arrived so the taller twin, Tanya, started to make a fuss. This is so unprofessional, she said as she walked toward the white hangar bay. I gathered she was hoping to find someone to complain to, and it was the first time that I had noticed we were the only ones here. I read online the flights were always packed to the gills, so why were there only six of us? What do you suppose is going on? Isabella asked. She wasn't as chatty either. In fact, the whole group seemed on edge as we followed Tanya to the other side of the airfield. Even the wind had stopped blowing. Something about the night just suddenly seemed more sinister. As we turned to go back toward where we had parked, a sharp burst of air pierced the darkness and all of us felt it nearly knock us down. Tom, the Australian, lost his hat and actually tumbled over as I looked up and saw the large passenger plane seemingly appear out of nowhere. It was about the size of a Delta airline jetliner with at least the capacity for 150 passengers or more and painted entirely black to match the dark sky. A rumble of thunder crackled across the backdrop of the plane as I noted that there were only a few windows on only one entrance, further showing that they intended for you to have an immersive experience once on board. I knew it hadn't been there moments ago, and now all of a sudden it had landed. The ramp to the first class seating area was already lowered, as though they had been the ones waiting for us rather than the other way around. Isabella gave me a nudge and said nervously, I told you they know how to make an entrance. I nodded and grabbed my things heading toward the plane, as I spotted one of the stewardesses gathering luggage from the other passengers. Tom was the first in line, eager to be aboard. Welcome back, Mr. Bradley. Always a pleasure to have you flying with us, a pale blonde employee said. Her face looked so perfect, I half thought that she was a robotic of some kind, so pristine and exact. Tom became red in the face, apparently not anticipating that they would give away his apparent frequent flyer status and then dashed up the steps to find a seat before any of us had a chance to open a conversation about it. Do you have your tickets? The stewardess asked, focusing on the twins next. Riley, the shorter one, took them out of her pocket and both of them eagerly entered without much fanfare. I was next. Welcome back, Mr. Declan. I see you came prepared this time, the stewardess said as I took out my ticket. I gave her a look of confusion. This is my first time, I told her. The stewardess didn't blink as she ripped the ticket and told me, Well, of course it is. Yes, I must have confused you with someone else. I didn't bother asking any other questions as I figured it was probably part of the show and boarded the plane as well. At the front, before the first class cabin area, two more blonde stewardesses that looked almost identical to the one I had seen outside greeted me outside of the pilot's chambers and offered me a warm drink, which resembled some kind of raspberry tonic. Before takeoff, we recommend all passengers drink this mixture. It will prevent any sort of nausea or displacement, the first woman told me. I knew it was likely they wouldn't let me board unless I had downed the concoction, so I downed it hurriedly, and they pushed open the curtains to look at the interior of the cabin. Much to my surprise, it looked like an ordinary jetliner, with rows of compartments above the seats for luggage, and about five seats on either side of the aisle, most of which were empty. I checked my stub to see where I was supposed to seat. Economy row C. Seat 3. The Aussie was the only one of us in first class and I almost envied his deep pockets, wondering if his experience would be entirely different from our own. Back in economy, I immediately felt a bit more cramped and claustrophobic, especially due to the dim lighting. Was that for aesthetics, I wondered, as I moved to my seat and noted I was near a window, a window that appeared to be sealed shut. A moment later, an Asian businessman appeared from the curtain and nodded sitting down next to me. Did you get here late? I asked, not recalling him in the crowd outside. 
He responded in his native tongue and took the seat beside me, nervously fidgeting with his wedding ring as more passengers boarded. Bloody hell, where are all these people coming from? I asked, noticing a whole family pass us to go to third class. I reached over to my window to try and see if maybe a large group had shown up at the last minute, but then Isabella reached from the row behind me and kept me from opening it. I wouldn't do that if I were you, she warned. I snatched my hand away, tired of her games and pulled the shutter on the window up anyway. But the airfield didn't look familiar anymore. Instead, it seemed as though we were landed somewhere in a busy city district, like Hong Kong or Seoul. Nowhere near the same rustic countryside of Midwest America. What the? I whispered as Isabella shut it back. We're about to take off and trust me, you want these closed. She warned again. This time, I decided to listen. Another stewardess appeared near the front of the cabin and grabbed a small speaker connected to the compartment beside her to give us a few guidelines. I couldn't help but to notice now the plane was seemingly packed full of people. Good evening. On behalf of all of us here at Full Moon Flights, we want to thank you again for joining us on this amazing journey. The captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign at this time, as we go over a few instructions in the event of an emergency. She said in a sing-song voice. Honestly, she seemed a bit too chipper given the information she next presented. As you might have noticed during your arrival, there are no emergency exits or equipment on board the flight. We have optimized the cabin to be entirely for the experience into the unknown. That being said, should we encounter any unanticipated turbulence, we ask all passengers to remain seated. The safest bet for us to reach our destination will be your full cooperation in these circumstances. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, especially how dangerous it sounded. I heard one man behind me cuss profusely as the stewardess next explained there was no emergency oxygen on the airliner either. Rest assured that what you will be dealing with tonight will take your breath away, but if you can face it, you will get to your destination as intended. She said as she finished her announcement, and then disappeared to the front of the plane. Something about the way she spoke made me feel very uneasy. Her choice of words felt intentionally vague. A clamor of gossip stirred as we all wondered what the heck we had signed up for. This must be just to get us nervous, a younger girl said a few rows up. I heard they intentionally make it this intense before the show starts. Another man said, It made me a little calmer to hear these rumors swirl about, but I still had no idea on what to expect. Behind me, Isabella squeezed my shoulder and muttered, Buckle up, Max. I obeyed her and listened as a new voice came over the intercom. This one was gruff and sounded distorted, almost inhuman. This is your captain speaking. We are T minus three minutes to take off. I'm not sure why, but the succinct way he spoke, coupled with the way my stomach was twisting into a knot, made me very uneasy. There was no turning back, no escape, I realized. And then the plane began to move. Instinctively, I gripped the seat cushion as I felt the engines begin to roar and the plane shake and pick up speed. The Asian businessman next to me did the same, closing his eyes and seemingly chanting, was he praying? I could hear the wheels skid against the runway, and the noise grow louder as I was pushed into the seat a bit by the thrust of the engines, and then we began to ascend. The roar got louder as I looked about at some of the other passengers to see the reaction. Some were grabbing bags to puke in, clearly new flyers while others were excitedly counting the seconds as we kept going higher. I wasn't sure which category I fit in but I was ready for the flight to stop its rush into the heavens. The plane shook again as we reached what I assumed was the highest altitude, and the light above my seat told me that I could move above the cabin freely. Immediately, I turned to Isabella to get some clear understanding of what to expect, only to find that she had already unbuckled and left to the third class cabin. 
and I sighed in frustration, trying to get the attention of a stewardess. But the woman were now standing toward the front, like statues, unblinking and looking on toward us. It was bizarre, but exactly what I expected for this sort of thing. I took a few breaths, then I calmed down, reminding myself that I should be trying to enjoy the experience. As I saw the curtain behind the stewardess open, and a woman wearing a geisha dress and kabuki mask enter, dancing amid the aisle toward my row. Immediately, the Asian man next to me tensed up. I saw his face and had a look of panic. Was this someone that he knew? Had the flight personnel secretly allowed them to board? Was he in danger? The woman got closer and then bowed respectively toward me, clearly waiting to sit beside the businessman. I'm not sure why, but I felt obliged to let her in, and moved out toward the aisle. The businessman started to shout something in alarm and tried to unbuckle, and then the woman straddled his lap. It almost looked like she wanted to make out with him, as I watched her gently touch his face. He started to shout louder, and I watched as the woman leaned in for a kiss. Someone squeezed my shoulder again and I turned to see Isabella standing there. Come with me, she ordered. I half wanted to see what would happen to the man that I was sitting beside, but still I obeyed. Clearly she knew more about this flight than me. As we entered a third class, I found myself taking a moment to adjust to the darkness in the room. There weren't any windows back here, and the only dim lighting was coming from the screens on the back of each of the seats. Miniature flat screen televisions that all of the passengers were glued to like zombies. Oh, what is this? I whispered, worried that our voices would break some of them from a trance. I believe they're doing something to them, brainwashing or something. I'm not sure. I was hoping you could help me get into the luggage compartment overhead, she said as we made it to the middle of the aisle. I noticed that the expressions on the people's faces seemed to contorted with terror or dread, as though whatever they were watching were driving them mad. Uh, sure, but before I do that, you need to be honest with me. Why are you really here? I asked. Isabella bit her lip and glanced toward the door. We don't have time for that. The stewardesses will be here any moment, so can you help me break this open or not? I huffed and I looked at the lock, realizing that I actually did have something that could open it up. Uh, yeah, sure. Let me go back to my luggage. Isabella told me to hurry as I returned to economy class and saw these stewardesses were now removing something from the seat near me. It looked like the shriveled up remains of the businessman. It looked like a corpse. Mr. DeClan, your in-flight movie is about to start, the first stewardess said, as I noticed that now there was a mini-TV in front of my seat as well. Had that always been there? Um, what happened to the man sitting beside me? I asked. I now noticed there seemed to be red dark stains on the seat. Blood. It's best if you keep your journey to yourself and not worry about others. The stewardess said with a pleasant smile. She stood there, waiting for me to comply with her instructions. Hesitantly, I sat down and put on my headphones. Everything about this was beginning to grow increasingly stranger and stranger. Not what I had signed up for at all. As I activated the screen in front of me, a burst of white noise pierced my ears and I nearly knocked the headphones off and then crashing waves filled the screen and I froze. What I was seeing didn't seem possible. It was showing me memories of my time as a child near the beach, memories that I had never shared with anyone. I watched in amazement as I saw my own mother in the waves. This was the moment that she had taken her own life, I thought, a secret that I had wanted to take to my grave. How could this flight know? The noise got louder as I heard whispers amid the waves. Something was speaking to me, telling me its own secrets. Chills ran down my spine as every moment played out exactly as I'd remembered it. My mother was just walking into the water, unconcerned with my cries as the waves crashed over her body. The whispers got louder, 
It sounded just like her. Join me, it croaked. And then, shots rang out amid the cabin. I jolted back to reality and saw Tom entering an economy class waving a pistol about. The stewardess was his victim. Her lifeless body sprawled on the aisle in front of me. Except, there was no blood. She just looked like a mannequin now. What the heck, man? I shouted, standing up as he neared my seat. Don't let him harvest you, Max. You're too good for that. We can make it through this together. But you have to help me, you hear, he said. Other passengers were screaming as he waved the gun around, warning them to stay back. What is wrong with you? They're all bloody frightened of you, I shouted. That's exactly what they want you to think. Now take me to that stupid chick you talked to earlier, he ordered. I raised my hands up defensively, and we walked together toward a third class. Look, whatever you think this is, it's not. These are just actors, I told him as we entered the dark room. Even when I said that, I didn't fully believe it. Something deep in the pit of my stomach told me that none of this was normal. I planned to use the sudden shift in light to take advantage of him, but I never made it that far. Instead, the entire plane started to shake due to turbulence, and he lost the gun. It slid across the floor as he fell on me, and I shouted to Isabella to find it. She obeyed and I turned to punch Tom straight in the jaw, as the lights in the cabin began to flicker. And then all of the passengers around us started to convulse and go into shock, seemingly being given a stroke due to the sudden loss of power. Amid the chaos, somehow Isabella found the weapon and aimed it toward me. Tom had already produced a knife, and I shot for her to shoot him. Instead, she aimed at the luggage compartment over our heads. A single bullet caused the lock to blast off, and several small bags fell, causing Tom's knife to become lodged in my shoulder. Crap, I said as I looked across at some of the passengers, begging them to help. Instead, they were beginning to attack each other. One man was mowing out his son's eyes and eating them. A woman was digging straight into her face, trying to rip skin off. And two children were smashing each other in the stomach constantly with sharp forks. Many hoped that I had that this was all an act died at that moment. Isabella scrambled to search amid the bags as Tom got his bearings. And then she found what she was looking for. It looked like a small briefcase. Don't, Tom shouted. I frowned, trying to figure out what the heck was happening, as she put the correct key code on the latches unbolted. Inside, there were six coals filled with a growing yellow serum. She grabbed one and rushed toward the Aussie. I crawled out of the way into one of the seats and she lunged and pierced his neck, forcing the needle all the way in. I saw Tom's eyes dilate and then go completely black, and then he fell to the floor unconscious. I snatched up his knife, just in case things got crazier from here. It was a smart call. Before I got a chance to even ask Isabella what the heck she was doing, she was through the curtain to economy class. I slowly stood up, trying to catch my breath when one of the mutilated passengers grabbed a hold of me forcing me to stare into their hollow, sunken face. There wasn't even a face there anymore, just a maw with endless teeth. Somehow, they had transformed into nightmarish beings. I pushed it away and tumbled over time to get back to economy class, pausing in between the two cabins to go into the restroom. The small room felt so much more claustrophobic than usual, as I locked the door and I looked at my reflection in the mirror. Splashing water on my face, I tried to get a hold of myself and chanted, It's all in your head, Max. It's all in your head. I gripped the sink for a minute and felt my breathing return to normal, hoping that maybe I was able to come back to normalcy. And then I noticed something shimmer in the mirror. I looked at it for a short moment, frowning in concern. And then my reflection smiled wickedly toward me. A second later, a strong, icy hand emerged from the mirror and gripped my neck. I was gasping for breath as I felt my reflection strangle me, 
and I reached into my pocket where Tom's knife was still hidden away. I sliced it across the doppelganger's arm, causing the strange black slime to bleed out from him as he loosened his grip and I escaped to the main cabin. I was still trying to make heads or tails of what was happening when I caught sight of the twins. After all that had just happened, I could hardly remember their names, Riley and Tanya. All I knew for sure was that they were both covered in blood, hobbling toward me with heads. Knives in their hands, having carved off each other's skulls, blocking my way to first class. I could hear Isabella shouting something to a stewardess as I looked back towards the third class. The jetliner was shaking violently again, and I heard the captain announce something overhead. Attention, esteemed guests. We are entering a rough patch and I advise you to buckle up. He said in a voice that sounded too excited for the coming maelstrom. Suddenly, I was thrust to the ceiling. The twins fell upward as well, their bloody bodies toppling like rag dogs as I found myself unable to avoid sliding into them. The airliner shook and I slowly moved toward the aisle where this all began, trying desperately to regain my footing. And then I heard a loud growl from the third class cabin. I shouldn't have looked. Tom's head peered out of the curtain. What followed it was not human. It had a long neck, like a giraffe without skin, and legs that were as wide as the entire cabin, stretching out towards passengers and stepping on them like ants. The legs had mouths like a Venus flytrap, shrieking as the strange creature twisted its body like a contortionist. It clung to the ceiling, Tom's pure black eyes looking straight at me, as his chest opened up and hundreds of miniature spidery creatures skittered towards me. Holy crap. Isabella shouted as she entered the room. Tom leapt toward her, shrieking as his mandibles ripped into her chest. The plane started to level again, and I moved down to my seat, desperately trying to find some way off. All I could think to do was break the window. I still had Tom's knife and my rattled brain told me to give it a try. Reaching toward the window, I raised it up even as I heard Isabella scream for me to stop. I was expecting to see just the darkness of the night. Instead, it was a blinding light, hitting me right in the face as I covered my eyes and tried to hit the window. I heard the glass crack, and I kept going as hard as I could. Suddenly, the screams in the cabin were replaced with the roar of the void. Whatever was beyond the window, I had managed to reach it, and now we were all about to be sucked out. I gripped my seat as hard as I could as alarms began to blare. Tom's gargantuan body was the first to go. It was like watching a camel be shoved through a needle hole. His face contorted and I heard the breaking of bones. He tried to grab a hold of me, his tongue lapping out and sliding against my face as I heard him mindlessly groan. His front claw grabbed my hand and I lost my grip. His legs hitting the shattered glass as I felt the roar of the plane against my body. It felt like I was a puppet, being dragged by a massive child. I was gripping the window, looking toward the heavens. I can't describe the impossible things I saw in that sky. This was not our Earth, not our reality. It was a kaleidoscope of universes crashing into one another, exploding in rainbows of colors that I couldn't comprehend. From the endless, ethereal streaks of light and dark, massive tentacles wrapped around the plane like vines, suffocating it. I could see something just beyond the horizon. A maw, the jaws of eternal damnation themselves, ready to swallow me whole. Isabella reached out of the window to grab my hand and struggled to pull me in. I was lost in the gaze of the eyes of the demonic entity that awaited us. As soon as I was inside, I saw that she had another serum prepared, this time for me. You really should have taken the pill, bud. She warned as she stabbed at my arm before I could get a chance to react. The world spun. I saw her face begin to melt away. In its place was the twins, 
growing two necks and forming a single monster to grin devilishly at me. And then they faded and showed the Geisha woman. Except this time, her kabuki mask was made of flesh, the remains of her husband. Her long cloud-like fingernails dragged to my chest as she removed the mask. And I saw my own mother, her lifeless eyes locked with my own as I fell into an ocean of sleep. I can't remember what happened next. It felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. I was above the plane now, watching as the tentacles of the monster crushed it and swallowed it whole. These shrieks of passengers, not just hundreds but millions from all across reality, being fed into this hungry monster's jaws. And then I was back in my seat. The unfasten your seatbelt sign flashed on and I gripped my cushion, looking toward the Asian businessman who was now seemingly alive. How was I alive? I looked down on my arm, rubbing the place where Isabella had injected me. It still felt sore. This hadn't been a dream, I realized as I looked around the cabin. The overhead intercom came out again. Attention passengers, we are about to arrive at our destination. Please remain seated to enjoy the full experience. I felt a squeeze on my shoulder and then Isabella whispered into my ear. Everything you just experienced was real. It just happened here, yet. You need to find Tom and get off this flight. Now. I was about to turn to her when she squeezed my sore spot harder and snapped at me. Don't look back and don't hesitate. Just run. And then she passed me a gun. Was it the same one that Tom had used before? I wasn't sure. My heart started pumping fast as I unbuckled and moved towards first class. The stewardesses were blocking my way. For some reason I knew they would try to stop me. So I swung the hammer of the weapon straight toward the left one. The two of them slammed into each other and it sounded like two dummies collapsing against one another in a store. I pushed past them to enter the first class seating area. Most of the passengers here were rich upper class, just like any normal flight. But as I moved down the aisle, I couldn't help but to notice the color was drained from their faces. They were trapped in their seats, unable to move. I reached toward one man to try and wake him, and his skin became as brittle as ash. They are husks, a voice said in front of me. I turned and looked to see a man standing there wearing a pilot uniform, but nothing about him made me feel that he was human. He might have once been, but now all that remained was his memory. What are you doing to them? I asked my voice trembling as I searched the cabin for Tom. Isabella's warning was ringing in my head, but I still needed to know more. Only what they signed up for, what you've already experienced. You've cheated, Max, seen the end of the journey and managed to make it back, but it doesn't matter. The fear we can harvest from your soul is endless. You will never truly lead this flight, he said, taking a step toward me. I clenched my fist and cocked the weapon toward him, letting loose a few rounds into his body. It didn't deter the specter. I'm not even sure why I tried after all I had seen. But it did grab Tom's attention. He stood up and moved toward me. What are you doing, man? Do you want to get us both killed? He shouted. I looked toward the gun. My hands shaking as I saw a scar was beginning to form on my arm. How had it gotten there? I think we might already be dead, I said, passing him the weapon. The ghost pilot was gone temporarily, but Tom warned it wouldn't matter. God, my head hurts. That drug really did a number on me, he said, rubbing the spot where Isabella had injected him. How is any of this possible? I said, my mouth dry as he led me back through economy class. This time, I saw my doppelganger again, sitting there, staring out of the window and watching as the jetliner began to shake again. Tom was rattling off an explanation, or an interpretation of events to me as we moved on. From what I understand, the plane moves beyond the realm of space and time that we know, past the horizon into a new endless dimension, one where pure chaos is born. 
The people, if they are that, who run this contraption, they are feeding a creature, trying to birth it into the reality, this reality that we know of. It's growing stronger, Max. Every new flight is harvesting more memories of reality and fear into it, he said. We were almost to the back of the plane now. No one had stopped us. His explanation made more sense to me as we stood there, and he started to look among the things before commenting. You probably have a dozen other questions about this mess. Like how I know all this and why Isabella, if that is a real name, is helping us. I don't know. I came aboard for my own wife. She boarded a flight three years ago, and I'm gonna find her. He paused and passed me the weapon along with the parachute. But that is entire journey ends, Max. You've got a chance to get out. Warn the world if you can. Just don't worry about me. If your wife is trapped here, you'll need to give her the serum that we both took. He nodded, nodding me adieu as he left to search the plane. The luggage compartment was oddly silent as the jetliner shook again and I put on my backpack. I slowly walked toward the back of the plane, near to where the landing gear was stored. It would be the safest place to jump, I realized. I crouched down and gently kicked at the shutters beneath the gear, wondering how strong they were. And then I heard a faint whisper. Someone was there with me. Instinctively, I jolted up and cocked the weapon. Show yourself. From amid the luggage, I saw a shadow move and slither toward me. Eventually, it had formed a shape. The ghost pilot. No, it was a doppelganger of my own mother, I realized. Don't come any closer, I wonder. Her eyes looked so watery and full of pain. Max, it's me. I'm real. This is real, all of it, she whispered to me. It can't be. You're dead, I shouted back. I saw you die. That was just one way my journey ended. It doesn't have to be that way anymore, she said with a gentle smile. The journey has shown me so much. We can have a life together. Endless amounts of lives. I heard another rustle amid the luggage. It was Isabella coming to check on me. Max, don't listen to her. You have to leave. No, you can't leave, Max. No one can. Board the flight. You are a part of the ship. Another voice cackled amid the rafters. My mother raised a welcoming hand toward me. This can be the life we never got together. She pleaded with me. I knew it was a trap, but it felt so inviting. To be able to escape into an endless cacophony of realities where I could experience the love of a mom I never knew. But none of it would be real, I realized. And I steadied my arm and fired straight at her head. The shadow screamed and blurred into a thousand slithering eels as Isabella shouted for me to go. I turned and slammed my foot against the landing gear again and again. The black slime oozed toward me, the screeching eels rapidly closing in for a chokehold. And then finally, the metal gave way and I saw clouds beneath my feet. Come with me, I shouted to Isabella. After all she had done to help me, it felt like helping her was the right thing to do. It's too late for me. I'm a part of the ship already, but I'll be here to help people get off every dang time, she responded. I reached for her, ignoring her insistence that she was doomed. But instead, these shadows ensnared her, and I watched as a black slime poured into her eyes and mouth. The shadow began to eat away at her body, and I knew that I had to leave. Crawling down to the landing gear, the rush of air beneath the plane was overwhelming. I heard these screams from the flight roar and didn't hesitate this time. I jumped. Spiraling into the air, I heard the roar of white noise and looked up to see an empty sky, like it had never been there at all. The force of my fall began to increase and I pulled on my parachute cord, feeling it tug and jolt me up in the air. And then everything began to slow. I was drifting amid the atmosphere. Gradually, I made my way to the surface, tumbling about on the soft ground. As I got my bearings, I was back at the airfield. 
Standing up, I checked my watch and realized that not a minute had passed since I had boarded. I shook off the parachute and stumbled toward the road, watching as some cars approached. I covered my eyes as one car parked in front of me, and a man dressed in a British explorer's outfit stepped out. What in the devil have you just been through, my good man? He asked, clearly startled by my appearance. I saw a couple behind him holding tickets, apparently awaiting an up-and-coming flight. I opened my mouth to tell to warn him, and then I saw a familiar face in the crowd. Isabella. I moved toward her, grabbed a hold of her arm and muttered, Are you real? Is this real? Hey, hands off. What's gotten into you, bud? She said, shaking me off like she didn't know me. I still felt like my head was spinning. You're here for the full moon flight, I asked, trying to understand and carefully choosing my words. Yeah, first time. I heard that there was a scream. You've been on one yourself, Isabella asked. I didn't see a hint of deception in her eyes. Slowly, I nodded, reaching into my pocket and passing her the pill that she had given me right before I boarded. Only she hadn't done that yet. You'll need this for the trip, I told her. She gave me a look of puzzlement and I walked off without another word. I knew there was nothing I could say to even explain how I understood her role now for this. A moment later, I felt a rush of wind and the dark jetliner appeared right behind the hangar bay like it had before. A journey into the unknown, an experience like no other. That's what the reviews say. But that isn't what mine is going to say. This is my review for Full Moon Flights. Don't believe the hype. This event is a killer. And you don't want to become a frequent flyer like me.